by the actual Department of Labor, but that was far too cumbersome and non-functional. In fact, the department is non-functional. Once the public realized that they are able to take all their monetary disputes, such as non-payment of wages, non-payment of overtime, and non-payment of leave pay directly to the CCMA, it is expected that there will be a burgeoning of referrals and could even double the number of referrals to the CCMA. This doubling of referrals will completely destroy the service delivery and will lead to a backlash from all the users of the Department of Labor. The trade union movement has already referred to a bloodbath minister with regard to job losses, and once they realize they will not receive the same service delivery with the same limits as they have so rightly expected in the past, there will be a bigger problem. Over and above the CCMA, I've had meeting with assisted workshops for the disabled. The disaster that has met these workshops is unspeakable. With the new definition of worker and the advent of the national minimum wage, every single person who benefits from the workshop is by law entitled to 20 rand per hour with a minimum four hours a day. This despite the fact that the workshops are not profit institutions and are all running at enormous losses. These workshops across the countries have reported that their funding, both from the government and private sources, does not allow them to keep open as expected. Already we have seen two large workshops closing down. These workshops exist to give the disabled dignity and a place to go. Our government is hell-bent on destroying the hopes and wishes of the disabled community. It is a crying shame, Minister, and you can, that you cannot see the good work being done by the various welfare institutions. The universal minimum legislation has acted as a sword to cut the disabled community from doing anything beneficial for their beneficiaries. Despite requests from the various role players in the disciplinary sector, the minister has been wholly silent and heartless. President Ramaphosa mouthed good things to the disability sector, making all sorts of various promises, but actually doing nothing at all. The simple solution would be to exempt the workshops and the disability sector from this wage. Please vote DA. We would do that. We will support the disability sector. Thank you. The EFF has four minutes. Thank you, Speaker. The national minimum wage was from the very start rushed, not properly thought through, and did not take into account the opinion of all stakeholders. As a result, the bill is badly written, as a number of mistakes, which is why it had to be amended less than a year after the President signed it. But most importantly, this bill does not guarantee a living wage and dignity for the South African worker. Anybody who thinks that a 20 rand minimum wage is acceptable is deluded and has never had to face the pain of working and giving your all for 12 hours, yet you still end up seeing your family go hungry. That is nothing more than glorified slavery. The national minimum wage bill is a microcosm of the ANC rule for the last 25 years. The ANC were their fake communists. You talk left and you walk right. You claim that this bill and the original act will serve the interests of the working class, but in reality, it will ensure that capital in South Africa will continue to have access to cheap and expendable black labor under the guise of radical rhetoric. But the ruling party in its alliance with capital has become so blinded by money and greed that it does not realize that the workers of this country do not accept this minimum wage and they see it for what it is. That is why the unions with alliance, within the alliance are falling apart because they are so unable to represent the interests of the working class. 20 rand is far too little. You must remember that the 20 rand minimum wage was first proposed nearly five years ago. Since then, inflation, petrol prices, and the general cost of living has massively devalued that 20 rand, which we even then objected to. Secondly, the national minimum wage has far too many sectoral exemptions, which will mean that the very workers who this bill was meant to protect will not even receive the meagre 20 rand which government has promised them. These exemptions include farm workers and domestics, already two of the most exploited sectors in our society. This amendment bill was a wasted opportunity. If the other members of this parliament were as genuine in their commitment to ensuring the economic liberation 
of our people as the EFF. They have, would have used this opportunity to amend the original wage bill to radically change it and ensure a living wage for all working South Africans. The Constitution states that the Republic of South Africa is founded upon the human values of human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. The national minimum wage clearly disregards the Constitution. It is, the, it is a spit in the face of workers, and instead of guaranteeing the dignity of the South African workers, it instead condemns all workers living on a wage close, which resembles modern-day slavery and continued exploitation and continued hyper-exploitation by capital. The only hope for the workers of this country is an EFF government where domestic and farm workers will earn a minimum of 5,000 and petrol attendants a minimum wage of 6,500 rand. And workers must note, when we speak about a decent minimum wage, uh, the jeers and laughter from the ANC who are totally anti-black and anti-worker and pro-capital. You are exploiting our people and you will suffer and you will pay the price on the 8th of May when the people of this country will vote you out of these benches and you're going to do join the DA on this side. We reject this bill. Thank you very much. All other parties have three minutes to make their declarations. Honorable Speaker, the IFP conveys its condolences to our colleague, Honorable Jackson Mtembo, and his family for having lost their daughter. Uh, Honourable Speaker, the position of the IFP about this bill is uh, known. We have debated it uh, in the previous uh, debates. And we, as the IFP, we still stand that if government cannot lead by example by paying EPWP workers a minimum wage, and they're saying they cannot afford to pay 20 rents per hour to the EPW people, then we feel that uh, the uh, PPWP employees should not vote for the NC, but rather vote for the IFP because we have stand with the workers. Although we support the technical amendments, but we are urging uh, all EPWP workers to not to vote for the NC on the 8th of May, but rather vote for the IFP because we are prepared to give them a, a national minimum wage like it is agreed. You cannot pass a bill for others and leave the bill for yourself because you must lead by example as government, although we support the technical amendments. Thank you. Honorable Kubisa. Ngikelo kubonga kakulu somlomo wale nchilu ngi bingela malu ngashon pegile in national freedom party ya asesega le sistribiel sasho ke Mshoni shwa somlo mwuguti noma sesega Kutwa mwona kuti kubene putel kulu guze kube Kubene listribielo Kulo mtetu wa sivivinyo mvenu we putel enze Ogu nye esa kusho pambilini mshaza nufika kule enzo Sashu kuti Umtetu wa sivivinyo lo ubaluleke kakuze kube Kubene listribielo Kulo mtetu wa sivivinyo mvenu we putel enze Ogu nye Esa kusho pambilini mshaza nufika kule enjo. Sashu kuti. Umtetu wa zifivinyolo ubaluleke kakulu kukuli mbilo za bandu bagi itikotu, bagi itikotu. Sina kukalaza kuti. Iima lile abazo itola ingane ngosuku. Ugwa. Sina kukalaza kuti. Iima lile abazo itola ingane ngosuku. Uguba guzo ba 120 rand, guba 3,500 Ngenyanga yonke ingane kodwa ke sasho ukuthi asikwazi ukuthi sichithe amanzi nengane nobhavu konke sikulahla ngoba ikhona into yokufanele ibe setafuleni ukuze abantu bakithi kube khona bakutholaya sazi ukuthi futhi sebegcila zwisikhathe side bengathola imhlomo ledingekayo sake sakhuluma futhi somhlonjwa somlomo sakhuluma ngalaba bavikela ama security officers nalaba abasebenzi basendlini naba sebenza futhi eh kuma farm Ganye na ma mine workers na mine abanda batashiwe abanga holigas uguti boating ubegelelas konda kufuta somlo muguti umtete 
yinto eqhubekayo ehambayo kuba khona isikhathi lapho buya futhi ucitshelwa khona ukuze qhutshe kulunga isimfuno zabantu bakithi bethola ukusizakala ezweni lakithi sazi ukuthi futhi fanele bavikelwe kabasebenzi laba abasebenza emaplazini ngokuchashazwa kwabo kanye futhi nalabo abangabalimi bavikelwe ukuze nabo bengalinyazwa abasebenzi bekwazi ukutholwa imhlomo lokuyona yona sasho ukuthi ke siyakwemukela lokho somlomo siqonda ukuthi izwe lakithi lisathuthuka uyadinge kumhlaba yadinge ke ibhedlela neyikole namaklinik nako konke zonke lezinto ofanele zenziwe ezweni lakithi sakhile ukwakha indaba yomsebenzi ofanele siyiqhathanise nendaba yokudala amathu bemsebenzi ukuze abantu bakithi basazekala we said therefore we note the technical error in section 17.4 so that it correctly refers to section 4.8 as opposed to 4.6. Then the National Freedom Party wants to put it on record that 2019 should be a year of dealing with all the challenges that affect the workers of our country, especially those who are at the bottom of the ladder or neglected when it comes to getting decent salaries. We support the amendment. Thank you very much. Honorable Phil Tane. The UDM has no objection to the bill. This bill is up for consideration at a time when South Africa is struggling to even achieve 1% economic growth, and this has been the case for the past couple of years. The initial cost uh, forecast five years ago was set at 2.5% growth. Then it was revised down to 1.9, then to 1.3. With all of the downward uh, spiral, hundreds of thousands of jobs were continuously being shredded by the bleeding economy. On the one hand, the beneficiaries of big-time corruption were backing millions, milking our economy to the detriment of the employees. All of this disaster was happening under the watchful eye of this ANC, which now wants to extend its power by another five years. Judging the ANC on its performance for the ending five years, one is strongly persuaded to believe that it just does not make sense to vote them back into power unless you are a beneficiary of the corruption that has taken funds away from the service delivery programs to the pockets of a few. Or if you are deliberately ignoring the reality that the ANC no longer cares for the struggling majority of South Africa. In the midst of all this, that has been increased by this ANC, thus putting more strain on the already lean pockets of the people. The proposed minimum wage is so small when judged against the rising inflation that it simply cannot even sustain a two-person family. A UDM-led government would have created a far better environment for economic growth that results in far better wages. Listen, straight cash is very vulnerable to inflation. It depletes the operational funds of employers and is seen by them as being unbearable. Rather, a repackaged offering with the following benefits would work better for both employer and employee. Now, this is where the ANC needs to listen very carefully. Good afternoon, Deputy President. Transport subsidy for employees. Already 40% of a salary, one salary goes to transport. School fees for employees' children. Employer-negotiated grocery discount offered by strategically located outlets. Subsidized housing costs. Package insurance benefits. We should avoid straight jacketed approaches born out of inbox thinking. Rather, we should think about integrated systems that link the employer with other companies from which elements of these packages can be sourced. Examples of such are the following negotiated transport costs with the transport providers, housing, local agreements with the locally based contractors. Housing is a, con is a constitutional entitlement. These two examples are employer-driven packages that can result in a, a, a better value for money. This is my last debate, and the UTM is on the side of the workforce of South Africa. For dignity and prosperity, vote nobody else except the UTM. Come the 8th of May, you will see a better future. Goodbye, South Africa. Now that the honorable members or the ANC. <laughs> honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy President, 
Honourable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honourable Members, members in the gallery as well as South Africans out there. We, as the ANC, support the National Minimum Wage Amendments correcting this technical error. And we want to be upfront, Honourable Speaker, to say that if we could choose again a minister who can lead this department, we will choose Honourable Mildred Willifant again because she knows the strives of the workers, she knows the challenges that has been experienced on the ground, uh, ground and she continuously had efforts to better the conditions of our workers on the ground. The EFF, please note that it's a national minimum wage, not a national living wage. But of course, I pardon you, Honorable Paulson, because you don't have any insight of, or any clue on what happened indeed in terms of uh, uh, reaching this conclusion of the national minimum wage because you were not part of the process. So I'll pardon you on this one. And also, please recognize that we, we've done extensive work together with the Portfolio Committee, as well as the stakeholders at NetLeg throughout the process to ensuring the final bill. Exemption, honorable members, provides that people don't lose their jobs through the retrenchments. And that's where we wanted to go. We wanted to protect the job security of the workers. With EFF proposals, honorable members, we have to be clear that it's just going to run this country into bankruptcy because they are making unrealistic promises to the people. They are making unrealistic promises in terms of social grant. We know Point of very order. well, honorable Point of members. Order. Point of order. What is the point of order, Honourable Member? A point of order, I am eating. Honourable Pama, Banga Linga Lasseki Selenzu. I get a superi saban to Tina Sisi, Sutetamanga. Honourable Member, this is a point of order. Take your seat. Yes. Take your seat. Proceed, Honourable Member. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. Point of order. That's Deputy exactly Speaker. what we are talking about. Deputy Speaker, please I, hold on. I, yes, I do Honourable. know that Honourable Fan Vick didn't hear the vernacular. Certainly, to call the honourable member on the on the on the podium a liar is unparliamentary, unacceptable, and it's name calling. Yeah. She must withdraw saying "suteta manga" because yeah. that means uh, that directly means okay. that she is lying. We we, we call that to order, please, Deputy Speaker. Honourable Sonti, is that what you said? I went out and chilled and got a lot of water. Maganga it. Maganga it. Tinto enge koyo. Mamela sis. Kalakuti unga begi ngaleon chelo bega ngayo. Kotisa unga begi mimbandela egwa fanelo we begi no we begi nchi. A kotisa sis. Aindi ya ya kotisa kebaba. Nya bonga kebaba. Because. Thank you very much. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Honourable Deputy Speaker. We know that the EPWP is an initiative of the ANC government, and we don't want the other parties to come and hijack this initiative as if it's their own and act as if the, it's the in the interest of the workers out there, because we know that the real reason is we wanted to put food on the tables of unemployed communities. Already, honourable members, more than six million workers will benefit through the initiation of the national minimum wage. Extra finances has been approved, including payroll auditors. You were present, honourable Begram, where it was reported to the portfolio committee. So don't come and mislead on uh, our members and the public out there. And we know that there's more than 600 extra uh, inspectors that will be appointed soon. And also we know that there has been workshops that got government tenders and turnaround would be filled soon. The DA claims, honorable members, that they created half of the jobs in the past year. Let, you give me, let me give you some facts. It shows that in 2018, Gauteng created 172,000 uh, jobs. Yes, Honourable Member, what's your point of order? Is there any reason order? for the Speaker to shout on the last day of Parliament? Uh, huh? Honourable Waters. We can see they are getting desperate now, ne? Gauteng <laughs> created uh, 172,000 uh, 
100,000 uh, jobs, KZN 135,000 jobs, Limpopo 59,000 jobs, and then the fourth place, Western Cape, with 29,000 jobs. So don't come and mislead our people. Well, it's not a surprise, because we know that the DA is not good with numbers, so we, we, we are understanding them. The DA wanted sectoral determinations in terms of the national minimum wage to remain, which we all know is as low as six rand per hour, and it's a total disgrace to our people. Noteworthy is the fact that the DA also wanted to insist that provision should be made for workers to opt out of the national minimum wage, 20 rand an hour voluntarily, another insult to the workers. Only time was one hour of committee members and no other cost in terms of this technical amendment. So don't come opposition and again come and mislead our people and say that we've, there was so much cost involved. We know, honorable members, that the ANC is uh, looking down and, and, and takes care of the interests of our workers. Ons weet bijvoorbeeld dat die meeste mensen wat vir die, a, vir die, vir die DA stem in die weeskap is kleerlinge, maar as ons kyk na hulle se benches en ons kyk na hulle se lees vir 2019, dan sien ons wie is die persoene wat die kan het sal kan present in die huis. Point of order, point of order, point of order, point of order, point of order. What's the point of order? My point of order, Che. Oh, see, I'm going to tell the Pansu Yalwa Manj. Here we are, Rasa. Tell the Pansu Mkaya. Hi, boy. Honorable member, I see you are competing. We can see they Please are very don't. desperate, honorable deputy order, speaker. Order, honorable members. So, uh, honorable members, let's be clear. Come on, say for us men, so they are there in all the provinces. Dat ons weet dat dit is net die ANC wat onze mensen zijn levens kan verbeteren. Dit is die ANC wat voor dieren bewijs het, dier die wette wat hulle in plek stel, dat hulle omgeef vir onze mensen van alle rassen. Dit is weer eens die ANC wat Victoria sal wees op die 8 mei en ons weet onze mensen sal hulle nie laat masleen nie, Ons weet dat die, die interest van die onze oppositie is net om meer geld te verdienen, om meer mensen te het. En ons weet dat as ons kyk na die begrotings, vooral van die DA aan die stad Kaapstad, dan zal ons zien dat die meeste geld wordt bewillig vir voordeur, voorheen bevoordeelde gemeenschappen. Als ons kijkt naar onze gemeenschappen in Kajelitja en die andere zwart gebieden en kleerlinggebieden, dan zal ons zien dat hulle die minste begroting krijgen. Maar dan komt die DA en hulle gee voor dat hulle omgee vir onze mensen. Ons vraag dat dus voor Zuid-Afrika, dat hulle, mo hulle moet nie moet misleiden nie en weer eens die ANC met de 70% majority kom, uh, uh, kom vote op die 8 mei 2019. Ek dank u. Dank u. Honorable members, the motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. Yes, Honourable Member. Honourable Paulson. Deputy Speaker, note the objection of the EFF. We will do that. Thank you. Uh, the motion is agreed to. The Secretary will read the second order. Second reading, National Minimum Wage Amendment Bill. As there is no speaker's list, I will now put the question. Are there any objections to the bill being read a second time? No objections? Okay, there being any objections, uh, let's put that question again. Uh, those in favor will say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Deputy Speaker, the yes, EFF calls for a division. Okay, a division having been called. We must expose you. The bells will we'll be rung. Honorable you. Paulson. But your stool no, and sit as a belief. The bells will be rung for five minutes.
Order members, please settle down, take your seats. I'd like to remind you members that you may only vote from your allocated seats. When requested to do so, uh, uh, simply indicate your vote by pressing the appropriate button below the yes, no, or abstain signs. If you inadvertently press the wrong button, 
uh, you may thereafter press the correct button. The last button pressed will be recorded as your vote when the voting session is closed by the chair. Order. The question before the House is that the National Minimum Wage Amendment Bill be read a second time. Are all members in the allocated seats? Yes. Voting will now commence. Those in favor of the bill being read a second time should press the yes button. Yes. Those against should press the no button. Yes. Those wishing to abstain should press the abstain button. I'm assuming that all members have voted. The voting session is now closed. Uh, honorable members, there is one abstention, eight no's and 245 yes. The secretary uh, will read the bill a second time. National Minimum Wage Amendment Bill. The bill will be sent to the National Council of Provinces for concurrence. The secretary will read the third order. Debate on Human Rights Day, Accelerated Socioeconomic Transformation, the key to human rights and a better life for all. All right, I'm informed the Honorable the Minister of Defense and Military Veterans will start instead of as it appears on the list. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And thank you, Honorable Members. I want to start by passing my condolences to the Chief Whip Jackson Ntembu for the loss of his daughter. And I want to urge all of us as parents, as mothers and fathers to begin to listen to what our children tell us. I don't know what may have happened to the child but I know as a mother who has lost a son that we parents must listen to our children. Our democratic dispensation will be 25 years on the 27th of April this year. Quite a milestone we all must admit. However, while our democracy's founding principles were hoisted on the strongest pillars of an ethos of human rights, our record on that question is very poor. South Africa still has some pockets of racism. Too many of our people, especially women and the girl children, continue to be the victims of violence, which translates into murders in some instances and sexual harassment. At the workplace, discrimination continues to, to define the workers' position on the basis of their complexion. It does not end with just black and white. The pay between whites and males, women, is unequal, and the pay between white males and black males is unequal. But so is the pay between black males and black females. Better basic services are mostly available to those who are in the urban areas. However, conditions in the black townships are worse than in the white areas, while those in the countryside are generally denied those rights. As we've already experienced, of course, in, in the debates, the many debates which we have all held in this house, it is very clear that indeed our human rights um, culture is poor. Originally, 21st of March was one of the days that was adopted by the masses of our people. It showed the extent of the racist regime's determination to deny black people their human rights 
when on that day our people were mowed down on for, only for demanding the right to vote. The motivation for the changing of the name Sharpville Day to Human Rights Day was part of the project to reconcile and unify our nation and move them towards the goal of a South African citizenry that would be united in its diversity in keeping with what Archbishop Tutu called the rainbow nation. It is a pity that when we had hoped to pull our people together from all our communities to adopt Human Rights Day and be part of the commemorative events relating thereto, most white people have consistently stayed away. The African National Congress, the leader of the Democratic Project of South Africa, wanted to persuade all our people to buy in into the political effort totally to destroy apartheid and construct out of its ashes a new nation of people whose main objective would be to work together to produce a better life for the entire nation. The ANC, right from its inception, was committed to usher in our country a democratic political project whose cornerstone would be a human rights platform. In a statement he made on the occasion of the celebration of the 20th year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1968, our president, Oliver Reginald Tambo, said, and I quote, 1968 sees the end of two decades of apartheid in South Africa. The Nazi ideology, which was pr the primary target of the declaration, finds its resurrection in the policy of apartheid. During the last two decades, human values in our country sank to primitive levels of elementary human rights were trampled underfoot on a scale of unparalleled in, in recent history. Naturally, the people of South Africa have waged courageous struggle against the infamous system for freedom, democracy, and peace. The reaction of the regime has been a systematic resort to force and terror directed against the masses. Persistent contravention of human rights is a recipe for violent conflict and war. The people can clearly not tolerate the arrogance of the oppressors indefinitely. Already the people have decided to stand up and fight for their rights, arms in hand. Our fight is for justice. We cannot cease until we have won. As we will in time, and in achieving human rights for all in Southern Africa, we will be making our contribution to the fight for human rights and freedom the world over, close quote. What President O.R. Tambo was telling the world was that the ANC struggle, even with arms in hand, was for human rights, democracy, peace, and justice. The 16th of December 1943 conference of the ANC held in Bloemfontein adopted, amongst others, as part of the African claims in South Africa document, a Bill of Rights. Presenting the African claims document, Dr. Kuma had this to say, we want, and I quote, the government and the people of South Africa to know the full aspirations of the African people so that their point of view will also be presented at the World Peace Conference. This is our way of convening to them our undisputed claims to full citizenship. We desire them to realize once and for all that a just and permanent peace will be possible only if the claims of, our, of all classes, colors, and races for sharing and for full participation in the educational, political, and economic activities are granted and recognized. As we are ending, um. Kuma asks for all freedom lovers to close ranks and take their place in this mass liberation movement and struggle expressed in the Bill of Citizenship's Right until Honorable Freedom. Minister, Thank you very much, expired. Honorable Chair. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Mugau. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Speaker. A decade ago, when, when I was in, in, uh, inducted into the South African Parliament, I was shocked and dismayed to hear some ANC members insult their opponents in the House by calling them dogs. 
Sadly, today, as I bid you farewell, at the end of my 10 years of national service, the situation has deteriorated. These days, the slayer of choice is race, racist, or racist. That is what the Chief Whip of the ANC, Honorable Jackson Mutembu, recently called all the members of the Democratic Alliance. In deference to his bereavement, I shall stop right there. Racism, racism is not a color or a power thing. Racism is an evil human failing that must be eradicated like all pestilences that frustrate our nation building efforts. The falsehood that blacks or people who do not have political or economic power cannot be racist is a blatant lie. The sixth parliament will have to work diligently to restore the lost dignity and to burnish the tarnished reputation of this house. The fifth parliament has not covered itself in glory in this regard. Regrettably, many South Africans were psychologically damaged by apartheid. Some were brainwashed to believe that they were superior, while some internalized inferiority. This has to change. We all agree that apartheid was an abomination that had to be eradicated. Similarly, black African nationalism, which wants to be the flip side order, of apartheid, order, Deputy must Speaker. be eradicated. Uh, yes, uh, Honourable Member. I sit with the uh, unparliamentary expressions from 2000 to 2015. It has been ruled in 2000 that the word lies is unparliamentary. Now, the blatant lies is even worse. This is a record of parliament that I have. I'm okay. forward to the table. Okay. I, I, according to this record, according to this record, I therefore move that the honorable member must uh, withdraw the unparliamentary terms. Honorable Speaker, David Chief. No. Um, Chairperson. Honorable, no, 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 no. May I address you? you hold your horses. You mm -hmm. hold your horses. Let me rule, and then you can express your views. You can now I want to rule on my behalf until I hand over to you soon. Don't worry, that time is coming. Honorable members, uh, I suggest that the honorable member proceed. That matter refers to, if you refer to political parties, uh, that's fine. If you refer to individuals, you are out of order. He hasn't done so, so we, you proceed, honorable member. I am a perennial optimist about the future. Uh, order, order. Out, 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 Are you quite clear? Out, Madam. Are you quite clear? Out, Valanje, Gangan. So say, I tell you, Bandra, you should go look green and I'm flaggy. Proceed, honourable member. I am a. Yabonga Slal. Thank you very much. No, no, honourable member, I haven't given you an opportunity. Okay, sorry. Why are you rising now? Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. Beng Sholu Guti, Sangati Beng Wapi in the footy na next term, Ube Deputy Speaker. Oba, I see Ban Bega. Yabonga. Thank you, Chala Pants, Madam. Thank you. Honourable Mdau, please proceed. Thank you. I'm a perennial optimist about the future of this country. But 25 years into our young democracy, my optimism is being sorely tested. My fears are growing that the country is drifting towards being a failed state. My spirit sank even lower last night as I watched ANC ministers and other members together with their hangers-on singing and dancing in this house in the prospect of amending section 25 of the constitution to impose expropriation of land without compensation. That ball has been kicked into touch until the next parliament, and that's where it should stay. Be warned, this country will rue the day the Bill of Rights is amended for electioneering and myopic, dangerous political expediency. That will be a direct attack on our democracy. That will be to spit on the graves of the brave men and women of this country who sacrificed so much for our freedom. Albert Lutuli, Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela, Robert Sobukwe, Albertina Sesulu, 
Steve Biko, Helen Sussman, Jafta Masamula, Winnie Madigisela Mandela. The list is endless. Rampant corruption, violent crime, and extreme poverty are the daily staple of the media. Rape and gender-based violence have become endemic. The Zondo Commission on State Capture is a stark indictment of the ANC and how the country has fallen. The massacre at Marikana in August 2012, dis described by some as the ANC Shabville, is a horrific, painful blot on our nation building efforts. The SED Mani tragedy of 2016 will forever haunt the failing ANC and the rest of the good people of this country. What has gone wrong? What is going wrong? The ANC has gone wrong. The people of South Africa have kept the ANC government for far too long. This is the sad end story of all failed African states. With about 10 million people who want to work unemployed in this country, the need to create jobs is the most serious problem facing South Africa. However, as long as the ANC remains in power, the creation of 11 million jobs envisaged by the National Development Plan by 2030 will remain a pipe dream. Interestingly, South Africa seems to be the only country in the world without a single problem. Due to ANC doublespeak, all the country's political, social, and economic problems and crises have morphed into challenges, and people wonder why we cannot solve the country's problems. ESCOM and its stage load shedding is a mega problem. It aggravates most of the economic problems and crises facing the country. Billions of rand are lost to the economy every day due to these blackouts. This can only mean more job losses and a violation of the human rights of the people who lose those jobs. We must do all in our power to turn the tide against joblessness, homelessness, and poverty. Time is of the essence. Restlessness and lawlessness are becoming pervasive in this country. The ANC government has gone wrong. The ANC has lost the way. The ANC cannot be redeemed. Come 8 May 2019, the ANC government must out. Vote DA on May 8th to build a South Africa for all. Honorable Mflongo. Well, uh, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, as the FF would like to convey our undivided condolences to Mtembu family for the, tra for, for the tragedy they've come through, and uh, we hope our mighty God will heal them with time. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy Speaker, on the 21st of March 1960, thousands of African people responded to the call by that eminent leader of African people, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, a call for African people to let go of their chains and take their quest for freedom in their own hands. Sobukwe fully understood that through emancip emancipation of our people will only come from the consciousness and actions of the people themselves and not through endless dialogue with oppressors, not through concessions that will compromise the indelible right of African people to dignity in their own land. As echoed in, the, in his words by Chief Albert Lutu, world, who said the following, the term of oppression shall have to be determined by the oppressed masses of our people, not by their own oppressors. In, in this response, in response to this, the racist white minority government made at 69 African people injuring more than 300 of them. It has always been the response 
of the races to kill those African people who stand up for themselves and right to human dignity. We know this because we experience this violence every day in our lives. We know this because we are the children of those killed and tortured by the supremacists who actually impose themselves as goddesses of our own destiny. Hence, we forgive them, but we shall never forget their evil actions. So today, we cannot be taught about human rights by the closest races who have been recycled through the years of apartheid tyranny, such as the Democratic Alliance on my left. We cannot be taught about human rights and dignity by the ruling party, which has overseen the deepening of the oppression of African people in this country since 1994. In scenes reminiscent of the 1960 Sharpeville massacre in 2012, thousands of mine workers in Marikana stood up for their right to be paid a living wage, just 12,000 rand. And guess what was the response? The response was a brutal reaction by security forces who gunned them down mercilessly, ordered by the one who has ascended to power as the president of this country, President Zuri Ramaphosa. Point of order. This modern day oppression. Yes. Point of order, uh, Speaker, mm -hmm. Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is a very strong statement. Rule 85 does not allow Honorable Mklongo to speak of the President in this manner. It is documented, Deputy Speaker. Honorable um, Mklongo. That is, the President wrote a letter Honorable instructing police Mklongo, to you. kill our people. Honorable Mklongo. Documented. Honorable Mklongo. And this will haunt him until he goes to Honorable his Honorable Mklongo, you are talking yes, as sir, I'm sir. talking to you. Thank Can you. you keep quiet, take your seat? Honorable Mklongo. You know what you should do. You can't make those statements in the House here without a substantive motion. You may, you may assume, as you do, that it's elsewhere. It doesn't exist in the House until you bring it by way of a substantive motion. So you withdraw. I don't know whether you are... You withdraw, Honorable Member. Documented. I have told you what you should Deputy do, Speaker. so you withdraw. Deputy I... Speaker. Honorable Member, I'm in the process of ruling. Don't interrupt me. No, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Member, I am ruling. This is a known fact. Honorable we Member, must not deny facts. Honorable Member, take your seat. I'm talking to your member here on the podium. Honorable Member, you withdraw. Let me withdraw because people know. Don't exactly do it unconditional. Honorable Member, do it unconditionally. Unconditionally. Yes. Proceed now. Black people everywhere in this country have no human rights to speak of. It is black people who stay in the infested and flea ridden shacks. Your time has because, expired, Honorable oh, Member. Oh, three minutes just now. Very much. Jefferson, you are very much. Honorable Sengwa. Honorable Sengwa. Honorable oh, Member. Oh, damn it. Good. No, you're wrong. wrong. Go ahead, Honorable Sengwa. Honorable Deputy Speaker, all the basic human rights as entrenched in our Constitution are all hard-earned. This against the horrific and grief-stricken history of this country in the very re is the very reason we commemorate Human Rights Day. We do this precisely because our country for much of the past 300 years and the nine wasted years in particular has not honored people's rights to dignity, freedom and safety. And one only has to look at the shocking statistics released every year by the South African police regarding rape and other forms of gender-based violence to realize that human rights violations are not a thing of the past. Gender-based and sexual violence has become part of the fabric of our social climate in South Africa. Lest we forget the bravery of the men and women who selflessly dedicated their lives 
to protest against past laws in Sharpville and all around the country on the 21st of March 1960, for which this day was marked, the Inkata Freedom Party salutes these fallen heroes. Human Rights Day is observed in conjunction with Water Week, which is an annual event that focuses public attention on the importance of water, one of South Africa's most limited resources and a basic human right. Water security is one of the biggest challenges facing South Africa and the world, especially the developing world in the 21st century. And precisely for this reason, why we must make sure that we have a Department of Water and Sanitation which is fully functional, adherent to the PFMA and Treasury regulations, free it of corruption, clean it up, and secure the sustainable livelihoods of our people. Honorable Deputy Speaker, economic growth in the absence of adequate measures to promote inclusive and participatory development is unsustainable. An absence of accountability and the rule of law in the economic sphere, inequality, corruption, mismanagement of public resources, and austerity measures continue to trigger civil unrest in many parts of the world, and this country in particular, which in turn undermine the sustainability of long-term development and growth. All efforts to accelerate socio-economic transformation and economic justice are stunted in the main by the inability of the government to effectively promote and respect the doctrine of human rights. Mm -hmm. Human rights are indivisible and interdependent, and the consequences of corrupt governance are multiple and touch on the human rights of all South Africans, whether it's civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as the right to development. Our country has been tainted by corruption, state capture, self-enrichment by those in power, to the neglect of the higher mission and placing one's self-interest before the community's interest, all of which has a negative impact on the enjoyment of all human Honorable rights, member, especially for the most vulnerable sections expired. of society, the poorest of the poor. I thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is the Honorable Kubisa. House Chairperson, thank you very much, honorable members. The National Freedom Party conveys words of condolences to the chief whip of the majority party and the family for the loss of their daughter. The celebration of human rights gives us the memories of where we come from as a nation. We are a nation that was bruised, victimized, and tortured before we could gain our democracy. It was not an easy journey. On this day, the 21st of March, 1960, 5,000 to 7,000 marchers and protesters marched to the police station to submit a memorandum against the past laws, and 69 of them were massacred by the police. They were gunned down for a just and a peaceful cause for their land and some fundamental rights that were, depri they were deprived of by a major minority government. So today, we are indebted to the founders of our democracy for what we are. We have to cherish this democracy and ensure that we use it responsibly. The former President Mandela rightly maintained, and I quote, freedom should not be understood to mean leadership positions or even appointments to top positions. It must be understood as the transformation of the lives of ordinary people in hostels and ghettos, in squatter camps, on the farms, and in the mine compounds. It means constant consultation between leaders and members of their organization. It allows us to be, to be in constant touch with the people, to understand their needs, hopes, and fears, and to work with them to improve their conditions, close quote. We have to, ma to master that courage, attitude, and potential which remind us that those we are, we are leading are without some physical amenities and resources, which is a so daily need for the restoration of their dignity, identity, and humanity. I refer here to our brothers and sisters who have no water, electricity, homes, and still language in poverty. South Africa is not free until we achieve economic liberation. The war against poverty and unemployment must be waged from all fronts. We need to give our youth and children the best education that will make them globally competitive. And not only uh, that, but also introduce them to the digital and technology mode of the Industrial Revolution. We need to produce independent and creative thinkers who will seize the moment and maximize legal opportunities at their disposal to create their own jobs 
and start their own businesses. We need to focus on entrepreneurship development. We need to collectively master a resolve that says fraud, greed, corruption must be rooted, exposed, and shame those who are looting the purse of the state. They must be arrested, charged, and put behind bars. We need to revive, revamp, and rebuild our old infrastructure and unlock it to create jobs. We need well-equipped and well-resolved educators. Your time has now expired. Thank you, House Chair Pearson. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we, Honorable Kwankwa, go back to your waiting bench, please. And now we invite the Honorable Teke to present her speech. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair, Honorable Members of Parliament. Uh, good afternoon. The Deputy President of the country, uh, Honorable Ministers, Deputy Ministers and Members of Parliament, let me join other Honorable Members in conveying our heartfelt condolences to the Chief Whip, Honorable Jackson Mutembu and his family on the passing on of their daughter. No parent can never take a pain of bearing his daughter. We ask God to give them strength and comfort in this trying time. Malukwa Parliament a tutlehang gare ke tika letsatsi le la ditshwanelo tsa batho mo nageng ya rona re tshwanetse go itekola gore re tswa kae e bile re ikella go isana ga ya rona kae re tswa le fatseng la gepeta mo go neng gona le ditlaisego le matlhotlhapelo mo basadi le bana ne ba sna ditshwanelo re tswa mo nakong e Africa borwa segolo bogolo ne ba tselwa le fatshe ka dikgoka le maruo a ne bana le ona mo ngwana wa mmala wa sibilo o ne a sa tshwanela ke go fitlhela thuto e maleba morago ga gore puso ya rona e teletsweng pelo ke mogatlo African National Congress re bona matshelo a batho a tokafala e bile re anetefatsa gore mo re sentseng teng re tla bakanya mo re tlhaelang teng re tla oketsa e bile re ikela gore matshelo a batho ba rona re tla tokafatsa Raigana Horeta Busesa le Fatsi Lidi Kungo Zaona Hubing Balona. Rata Horaya Bahai Sore Repilutswana Boela Mano Matasahawe Oseboni. Are dire moho bahai so kwenna mutwana wamalo wamaloba ubuile are fifing kosora na kadikubo. Honorable members, the NC has proven since nineteen ninety-four that is, it is a capable and a progressive organization which aims at building an inclusive society, in particular in the economy, and to realize shared prosperity, social justice, and human so so solidarity. Over the past 25 years, the lives of the people of South Africa have changed for the better. 3.2 million free houses have been built, which has benefited 14 million people. More than 4.5 million people living with HIV receive ARV treatment while the overall rate of new infections is decreasing. We have dra dramatic progress in the prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV. 84% of South Africans have their homes electrified and 88.6% of South Africans have access to clean drinking water. We'll never and ever forget the, the, the social grants that are benefiting majority of our people have increased in 1994 from 3 million to 17.5 million benefiting the children, our elderly people, people with disabilities, and our veterans. Under the ANC leadership, we have reintroduced a, minima, a national minimum wage, which of course will improve the dignity of 6 million workers who are currently being paid below the national minimum wage level of 20 rand per hour. We advance the cause and the rights of workers to organize collect collectively by gain, refuse dangerous work, and to strike, which is their democratic and human rights. Thank you. Bom meki di khatla mela masisi za democracy ya rona. Le fatsi le le satse eng bom metsi ya ke le fatsi le le sa goleng. Ke ka mo mo khatlo African National Congress o ikela go dira le me khatlo e lwelang ditshwanelo tsa bana le basadi go ya mapuso nokeng. Re ikela go dirisana le mafapha a puso a semolao go bona gore bomme 
ba sirelediwa e bile di sinye le ba 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 go itsela ka di goka ba 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 gatellang di tshwanelo tsa bana le basadi ba ya ntlo honorable chair another key achievement for human rights is the announcement of the zero rate vet on sanitary pets as from the 1st of april 2019 Many young girls and women are forced to miss schools and other activities as a result of menstruation and not being able to afford the sanitary towels. The zero vet on, uh, free, the zero, uh, vet on these products will help ease the burden on empower, impoverished women and girls who can afford the necessity. We also are advocating for free sanitary products um, to the young girls, but the Minister of Finance also announced that free pets will be given to girls in need uh, in schools around the country. This is the achievement by the African National Congress government. And thank you to all the stakeholders who have participated in the, pro in, in the process and the multi-party women's caucus led by Mayor Mastori, the portfolio committee on women led by Mayor uh, Tandi Memela, and also Medi Diza, who have been at the forefront uh, in this program. Honorable Chairperson, we call on South Africans to unite and reject those who claim to support human rights when it is time for election and after being voted out, they show the real colors. South Africans must reject political party that is against the majority of South Africans having access to land. That political party advance landless of majority of people. Reject them. South Africans must reject party that still praises Bantu education and claim to be building one country. Those people want to reverse the gains of democracy, reject them in their political party. South Africans must, must reject political parties that calls people constitutional blacks. Reject them in their political party. You know, she, she, she is one of you. South Africans must reject political parties that increase property valuations and rates in order to alienate majority of people from owning property and staying in affluent places which were previously reserved for certain racial groups. Those people advance racial divisions. Reject them. South, Africa must re South Africans must reject spray singers and supporters of apartheid Israel abuse on Palestine. Reject them. These people want to reverse the gains of our freedom which people have fought for and denied for. Honorable Chair, House Chairperson, the ANC has proven since 1994 to be the champions of women's rights. We wholeheartedly thank South Africans for giving us the mandate of, lead, of leading this country. We are indeed grateful. And on the 8th of May 2019, we will enter into a new contract with the South Africans, which has been confirmed by Ipsos survey, and will grow South Africa together and we commit, one, to transform this economy to serve all the people. We commit we, that we'll advance the social transformation and continue to make education and health our time is now priority. expired. Thank you very much. I thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Kwankwa. Kusa Paul Wagwam Tembo. Sifuna ukuti aklanga lunge langa. To Dwini, Menze Tiko, Pumle, and Gona Parade, Um Kanye Selling or Kanye Song at me. House Chair and Honorable Members, despite having a Bill of Rights that protects the right of every South African and the significant progress made since 1994 with respect to first generation human rights, which are civil and political rights, Public confidence in government's willingness and ability to, to tackle second generation human rights, such as socioeconomic rights, has to a large extent eroded. Stressing the failure of South Africa to tackle socioeconomic rights, in December 2018, the South African Human Rights Commission said, and I quote, lack of access to socioeconomic rights provides the clearest reflection of the levels of systemic poverty, unemployment, and inequality in South Africa and demonstrate the persistent, persistent rather recurrence of the cycle of poverty. House Chair bears repeating that 25 years after freedom, South Africa is still one of the most unequal societies in the world because government's redistributive policies which promised a shortcut to prosperity for many have delivered that prosperity to a select politically connected few which has undermined the pact of a broad-based empowerment. The state resources that should have been used to eradicate poverty, reduce inequality, 
reduce youth unemployment and create jobs for our people have been appropriated to a large extent for private use. They have been used to enrich, especially over the past 10 years, the masters of state capture. While this occurs, our people's daily struggle for survival defies description. Compare this or contrast this, uh, this with the lifestyles, the opulent lifestyles of politicians who are not known for parsimonious living habits, especially the ruling party ones. House Chair, yesterday the South African Human Rights Commission found that the Mpumalanga Department of Educate, Education violated learners' rights after 679,000 learners did not receive all their required textbooks in the financial year 2017-2018. Add this then to the, the number of, of learners who have to attend smart schools on a daily basis. House Chair, we must do everything in our power to root out the widespread and mostly underreported violence against women and children in our country. One of the issues which we must consider seriously is that it's going to be impossible to realistically address socioeconomic challenges in the medium to long term without first addressing the crippling energy crisis, which is due to the mismanagement of the African National Congress of the, of the economy by the ANC. House Chair, one of the issues which we must consider- Honorable member. Your time has now expired. Thank you. The next speaker will be the Honorable Vessels. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. House Chair, the Constitution of South Africa in Section 24 guarantees each citizen the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health and well-being. The residents of, among others, Tabong, Valcom, Modimole, Krenstad, Sunny's Hof, De La Revo, Tuaing, Ditabotla, everyone who live near or make use of the Val and other rivers are, however, not afforded this right by the ANC government. Honorable Teke, South Africans should reject the ANC. Die selfde grondwet bepaal dat elke mens die recht tot toegang tot water moet geniet. Maar hierdie recht is nie vir die inwoners van onder andere Maslon, Jana, Mafube en Garib beskore nie. Section 9 of the Constitution guarantees the right to equality. But under the ANC government, discriminating legislation is imposed. And equal opportunities for all are undermined by racial classification and quotas. Section 31 affords citizens the right to cultural, linguistic and religious communities. But those who strive for these rights are classified as racists. Universiteite word vir Engels en Suid-Afrikaners se taalrechte word vertrap. Artikel 10 beloof die recht op menswaardigheid, maar nie volgens die ANC nie. Onder hierdie regering word pasiënte in staatshospitale van hom menswaardigheid gestroe, omdat hulle soos drek behandel word. Die aanseese idee van menswaardigheid is die van ou mense en kinders, wat dagelijks langs rou die wol moet loop en tussen hulle huise moet verdier. Die aansee laat toe dat geld gesteel word en bestee word op liekshede en veiligheid van hom ministers terwijl kinderhuise sy staatssubsidie so laag as 17 rand per kind per dag is. Dis een skande die aan C moet verwerp word. The L Constitution guarantees the right to own property. But once again the ANC in his power hungry struggle for votes in the coming election is willing to gamble with yet another human right for personal gain. Honorable Mapisa Nkakula the ANC government is the new oppressors who feel nothing for human rights. It is your government whose nation-building recipe has failed. Let us learn from the past, let us live in the present, and let us focus on the future. The struggle for human rights and for dignity of all South Africans continues. Aluta continue. I thank you. I now invite the Honourable Minister of Justice and Correctional Services to address the House. The Honourable Minister.
As chair, let me join uh, others before me in uh, expressing our profound condolences to the chief whip and his family on the unfortunate and sad loss of uh, his daughter um, this morning. Uh, <clears throat> um, honorable members, comrades and friends, as we celebrate this Human Rights Month and in particular this uh, anti-racism week, we recall the many strides that our forebears have hitherto made and many laid their lives and shed their blood for the liberation and freedom that we enjoy uh, today. Uh, honorable members, fellow South Africans, <clears throat> in tw on 20 September 1909 uh, and in the aftermath of the so-called Anglo-Boer War, properly construed as the South African War, the British Parliament passed the South Africa Act of 1909, which created the Union of South Africa from British colonies of the Cape of Good Hope, Natal, Orange River Colony, and Transvaal. The establishment of a white-only Union of South Africa to the exclusion of the black majority in 1910 missed a golden opportunity to build a united and prosperous non-racial and non-sexist South Africa that we seek to create today. <clears throat> society, <clears throat> and this would have been a society inclusive of all national groups that would have evolved and developed in a manner which today we could only envy had occurred. The results was to divide the people and meet out privileges solely on the basis of skin color and to balkanize the country into so-called homelands. This was spearheaded with the passage of the 1913 Land Act, which denied ownership rights to the black majority for the, with the consequence that thousands of people were forcefully removed from their ancestral lands, which provided fertile plowing, grazing, and hunting fields and places in which they thrived and had called home for centuries. The adoption of the apartheid policy by the National Party, which came to power in 1948, which was used to intensify the racial exclusion and oppression of the black majority, resulted in the passage of several laws such as the Calabar Act, Influx Control Act, Group Areas Act, Separate Amenities Act, Immorality Act, Bantu Administration Act, and many other laws to foster racial segregation and socioeconomic marginalization of the black majority, especially women. The outcome, <clears throat> uh, with the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1955, where over 3,000 delegates from different parts of our country representing people from all walks of life, uh, who met at Cape Town to consider and met, map out a vision of the kind of South Africa they would like to live in, we today have reason to celebrate for the forward thinking of our forebears on that occasion. During the, the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Freedom Charter in 1980, the longest serving president of the ANC, Oliver Tambo, said the following, and I quote, the Freedom Charter contains the fundamental perspective of the vast majority of the people of South Africa of the kind of liberation that we all of us are fighting for. Hence, it is not merely the Freedom Charter of the African National Congress and its allies. Rather, it is the Charter of the people of South Africa for liberation. It was drawn up on the basis of the demands of the vast masses of our country and adopted at an elected Congress of the people. Because it came from the people, it remains still a people's charter, the one basic political statement of our goals to which all genuinely democratic and patriotic forces of South Africa uh, 
can adhere, close quote. It was therefore only natural that when the constitution of the new South Africa was written, the Freedom Charter clearly served as the foundation upon which our Bill of Rights was hinged. It clearly maps <coughs> out the work that needs to be done to undo the uh, specter of apartheid which continues to haunt us to this day and to build a South Africa that truly belongs to all who live in it. The preamble of our democratic constitution contains the commitment to, amongst, others, uh, to, amongst other things, establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, lay foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law and improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. One of the methods used to achieve this objective is the inclusion of enforceable socioeconomic rights in the Bill of Rights. We have made great strides in the uh, deracialization and unification of the delivery of services over the past 25 years of democracy. Millions of people who were previously excluded now have access to education, water, electricity, healthcare, housing, and social security. The people shall govern, so says the Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter states that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the uh, <coughs> will of the people. In exactly 48 uh, days, the people of our country will exercise their will by participating in a general election where they will elect a government of their choice and we are certain they will once again affirm their commitment uh, and their confidence in the ANC as the leader of society by voting for the African National Congress overwhelmingly. South Africa is a participatory democracy with an active citizenry, a free and vibrant media, durable democratic institutions, including chapter nine institutions, and an independent judiciary. Members of the public are able to give government their views complaints and suggestions during the uh, <coughs> unmediated public engagements such as Honorable Minister, and public your hearings. time is now expired. We are committed to the cause you. of advancing human rights in South Africa and we are sure that our people thank will you, affirm Honorable that Minister. Your by time voting is expired. for the ANC I now invite the, the Honorable Carter I thank to you. address the House. The Honorable Carter. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, with respect, at the end of a quarter of a century since our political freedom, one would have expected to find evidence of a congratulatory theme for this debate, that we have realized much in achieving our vision of a reconstructed and developed society, and not a cry that we need accelerated action if we are to transform our society and realize our vision of a better future for all. The fact is that, as for people, we entrust government to protect and respect our fundamental human rights, to heal the divisions of the past, to reconstruct our society, and to progressively realize our socio-economic aspirations and our hope for a better future for all. We are elected to represent the people and to ensure government by the people. Parliament is entrusted with the power to initiate and make laws, to create the legislative framework and imperative for the transformation of our society and the realization of our national aspirations. So, Chairperson, the real matter that we should be debating and considering is, how have we done? Have we delivered on the trust that the people have bestowed upon us, or has it been abused and betrayed? Sadly, we have failed. Our abject failure, and that as a collective, is recorded in the high-level panel report that we commissioned. 
It is mirrored in the sorry and the deteriorating political and socio-economic quagmire that we find ourselves in. It is to be found in our failing and maladministrative systems and structures of governance, in our deteriorating delivery of services, in the systemic corruption that pervades government, in our stagnating economy, rampant unemployment, growing poverty and worsening inequality, in the growing despair and lack of hope that grips our nation, in the rise of populism, radicalism and the naked racism, in the increasing lack of faith in our political system and in democracy itself. We face our gravest post-apartheid crisis with no end in sight. With each passing day, the true extent of abuse and betrayal of a trust and the faith bestowed in us become more evident, stark and alarming. The only real and lasting solution to ensure the accelerated socio-economic transformation of our society and the achievement of a better life for all is for our people, the electorate, to take back the power and trust given to the majority party and to place it in the hands of trustworthy, ethical representatives, reliable, accountable and incorruptible leaders. South Africa needs a new start. South Africans, Honorable the key is in your hands. Your time has now you. expired. <laughs> Honorable members, I now invite the Honorable Dudley to deliver a farewell speech. Not, Not yet. I'm coming back. <laughs> I mean, in five minutes, <laughs> not next year. You, you've got three minutes okay. to do what you want to do, Honorable right. Dudley. I'm going to say that the gender gap that exists in South Africa is a reflection of the systemic nature of exclusion and disadvantage faced by women, whether as a result of apartheid or of the broader pattern of patriarchy found in present-day South Africa. Now, I use the word patriarchy here with much caution, only too aware that gender advocacy has so often positioned itself as the enemy of women's rights to freedom of belief and their freedom to express that belief as they choose. As a Christian by choice and a feminist, having lived my 65 plus years of life in a world with systems and traditions designed to sustain a male-dominated world, learning to appreciate the sacrifices and achievements of those who stood up for women on many fronts, and now aware of the remaining strongholds in much of our thinking that still disempowers women, I am committed to doing what I can to ensure gender relations take on a healthier balance. When each of us holds, what each of us holds to be true is a combination of our cultural and religious beliefs, our experiences, observations, and learning in general. Through our successes and failures, we build critical analytical skills which lead to greater self-confidence and success. As empowered, for example, as I have been simply by virtue of of the fact that I was born white in a colonized part of Africa, it has taken courage to confront gender equity issues on the home front and in the workplace, and wisdom to know when and how to do it. The biggest challenge South Africa has in order to overcome the gender imbalance is, of course, the need for economic empowerment and transformation broadly in response to the legacy of apartheid. This makes the job so much bigger and gender equity can get lost in the enormity of the task. Women are only really empowered when they become financially independent. This begins with access to early childhood development, basic education and higher learning institutions. To succeed in business, however, women need to be able to access and mobilize private and business investments, benefit from public procurement, access finance and business development support, improve their skills, participate in networks and organizations through which they can support each other, and enjoy equitable representation in both the workplace and in public-private dialogue processes and mechanisms. As most institutions globally and locally tend consciously and unconsciously to serve the interests of men, gender mainstreaming, a process that recognizes and encourages institutions to adopt gender perspective in transforming themselves, is a necessary intervention. I, 
In closing, I want to summarize by saying women are empowered when they have access to resources and control over their own finances. I also want to remind myself that as a woman we have much in common, but we are also uniquely crafted and for many very different purposes and generalizations are therefore not very helpful. As a group, we are made up of those historically disadvantaged, presently disadvantaged, previously advantaged, presently advantaged, young, old, differently abled, women living in rural areas, city women. We can be each other's worst enemy or we can purpose to champion, encourage and empower each other. Our minds also need renewing as much as anyone else, especially when it comes to our tendency to prefer men by default. When we recognize our own value and we give ourselves and each other permission to be ourselves, we will be empowered. As the always wise Dr. Zeus once said, today you are you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is newer than you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dudley. I now invite the Honorable Skosana. Thank you, Honorable uh, House Chair and Honorable Members. Let me first take this opportunity and join other Honorable Members in conveying our deepest sympathy and heartfelt condolences to the Mtembu family during these trying times. Honorable House Chair, in this human rights debate, 20 years into democracy and the attainment of freedom and the adoption of our constitution, I wish to start off by quoting the founding president of the ANC clique, Comrade Anton Mzwake Limbende, when in he said, and I quote, the African people have been told time and again that they are babies, that they are an inferior race, that they cannot achieve anything worthwhile by themselves without a white man as their trustee or leader. This insidious suggestion has poisoned their mind and has resulted in a pathological state of mind. Consequently, the African has lost or is losing the sterling qualities of self-respect, self-confidence, and self-reliance. Even in the political world, it is being suggested that Africans cannot organize themselves or make any progress without white leaders. Now I stand for the revolt against this psychological enslavement of my people. I strive for the eradication of this Yabas mentality, which for centuries has been systematically and subtly implanted into the minds of the Africans." Close quote. Honorable House Chair, this year marks 64 years since the Freedom Charter was adopted. The ANC entrenched the right to education as a human right, which is the realization that all doors of learning and of culture shall be open, as stated in the Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter further states that education shall be free, compulsory, universal, and equal for all children. Honorable members, early childhood education has been proven to be the key driver in impacting on a country's future's economic growth and improvement for the citizens of a country. In his 2019 State of the Nation address, His Excellency President Ramaphosa announced that the government will migrate early childhood education centers from the Department of Social Development to Basic Education Department, and that from now onwards, there will be two years of compulsory ECD for all children before they enter grade one. Senza Gwenzege, while the DA and the EFF are watching. Honorable Chair, alive to the promise of the Freedom Charter, the ANC committed to strengthening measures to improve access to higher education with the ultimate goal of achieving free higher education for the poor and the missing middle. The ANC-led government since it took power in 1994, has ensured that students coming from poor families with an annual gross income of 122,000 rands are provided with financial aid through loans and bursaries in order to access both university 
and technical and vocational education and training. Funding allocation to support student financial aid increased from 21 million rands in 1991 during the time of TEFSA to 23.7 billion rands in 2018-19. Senza Gwenzege, while the DA and the EFF are watching. Honorable members, in line with the resolution of the ANC's 52nd and 53rd national conferences, the ANC government has ensured that it accelerates the implementation of a new financial support model to ensure that academically capable, poor, working class and middle strata students are supported to access higher education and receive fully subsidized, free, higher education and training. I think that deserves an amen. Senza Wenzege, while the DA and the EFF are watching. Honorable House Chair, Tivet College Enrollment. Honorable Susana, will you take your seat, please? Let me take this point of order. Why are you rising, Honorable Member? Can you not ask you to stop us, Kosana, to a Yagu Papa? We are Papa's Kosana Manch. No, Honorable Member, that's not the point of order. Yeah. And you know it's not the point of order. Yeah, we are Papa. So please take your seat. Can you leave EFF alone? Continue, well, Honorable Skosana. People of, of South Africa, vote EFF. Ah, uh, uh, it's not a church here. Honorable Skosana. We don't need any pastor here. No, Honorable Member, will you just continue? That's not the point. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable House well, Chair. Well, sorry, 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 sorry. Chief of Colleges enrollment sorry, has sorry, increased sorry. radically sorry. since the divine uh, uh, apartheid. Uh, from 134,688 in 1995. will just continue. I made the ruling. The honorable member is not audible. Just continue. Thanks, honorable house chair. Tivet College's enrollment has increased radically since the demise of apartheid from 154,688 in 1995 order, to 705,397 in 2016. This means that enrollment in Tivet colleges increased by almost five times over 21 years. I hope the Honorable Vessels is taking notes because he does not know these figures. He's still very young. Significant progress has been achieved with regards to artisan developments from 2012-2013 at 8,655 to 2016-17 at 21,188 artisans produced annually. Top trades are electricians, diesel mechanics, mechanical fitter, welder, automotive motor mechanic, plumber, boiler maker, millwright, and rigger. Point of order, Chair. <laughs> Honorable House Honorable Chair. Susanna. Oh, Hon Chair, point, point of order. Honorable Susanna, just take your seat. Chair. What is the point of order, Honorable Member? Uh, I want to to ask from you, Chair. Yes. Uh, do you know the meaning of Ugo Papa? No, that is not relevant uh, now. Chair, why you say a uh, uh, honorable member must continue? Because no. you don't understand Ugo Papa. You know what does Mama Kaula says? She says, Uuputi uh, umu, Yes. Like ESF. Yes, very, yes. Very, yes, it may be very helpful later, but at the moment it's not helpful at all. In terms of this debate, I'm requesting the Honorable Member to continue. Just continue, Honorable Member. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Yes, I'm wearing the red ties of the South African Communist Party. <laughs> Honorable House Chair, several instruments such as National Skills Accord which was signed by the Netlec Social Partners on the 13th of July 2011 are in place to ensure that these social, social partnerships yield positive results with regard to availing workplace-based learning opportunities for young persons in various skills development interventions such as work integrated learning, internships, learnerships, apprenticeships, etc. With these relationships, in the financial year 2016-17, we have seen more than 148,000 workplace-based learning opportunities being provided, especially for our young people through CETAs. Senza Wenzege, whilst the DA and the EFF are watching. Honorable members, 
Following the call by the NYTA, Public Service and Administration Minister, the Honorable Ayanda Jojo, made an announcement that from 2019, job seekers will no longer need Honorable work member, experience to get an your knock, entry your time is now level expired. government job. I now invite the Honorable Member. Senza Gwenze again, while the DA and the EFF Honorable are member, watching. Vote ANC on the 8th of May, Amanda. Thank you. Yeah. I thought Mzala you will lead a toy toy to the speaker's office for my return to this parliament. Uh, the 21st March. Okay, let me sorry uh, firstly also on behalf of the PAC convey our sincere condolences to the loss of his daughter, Honorable Umtembu. The 21st March is a very important historic day for the PAC and the African people in general. Firstly, on behalf of the PAC, let me correct in, with the strongest terms the, the distortion of history by our ruling party that this day is a, a human rights day. Uh, EPAC, when this call was made, Usobu knew that African people can demonstrate to the world genuine democracy in action, a democracy which is founded upon the, the ruins of the material and spiritual conflicts and the contradictions of the then existing uh, social order, a democracy in which human personality shall blossom. Fellow Africans, uh, men and women, they were mercilessly killed by the then apartheid regime as a response to a clarion call made by the Pan-Africanist Congress of, of Asania. Uh, we need to understand that uh, when EPAC embarked on this call, uh, at that time, it was a continuation of the program of action of 1949. And our primary struggle uh, at the time was for the restoration of land back to its rightful owners. Uh, that means the indigenous. And the land is not back yet to the indigenous uh, uh, African people. So it is very important for us as this uh, uh, government or parliament uh, to make sure that at least we address those issues, including uh, other issues like uh, the, the, the rate of the unemployment and, and so forth. So as PAC, we really tomorrow, obviously this year, we are marking the 60th uh, anniversary of the PAC. Uh, this organization has been around for quite a very long time. Uh, so it must be taken serious, more especially by the people in this country and uh, those that we fought for uh, during the time we were fighting against the apartheid, the, 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 the restoration of land. And also, even now, we are still fighting for that land to be returned back to them. It goes. It Honorable Lotre. Honorable Chairperson, Human Rights Day is supposed to be a celebration and a recognition of the fact that in South Africa we have a constitution firmly based on human rights. It is a day where we have to acknowledge that we come from a history where human rights were abused. But at the same time, we also have to assess what the state of human rights is in our country 25 years since democracy. The reality is, unfortunately, that it cannot be a celebration day. In fact, we have to ask why in the year 2019, individuals around us still have to struggle to have the most basic of their rights realized. 
For 25 years, this country under ANC government, a country that was supposed to be the beacon of hope, the country that was supposed to be the torchbearer for human rights, has had a dismal record of supporting human rights at the United Nations. This country sides with countries with questionable human rights records, where murder, extermination, forcible transfer, rape and torture of their own people occur, and the ANC supports them. This is the same government, as we heard earlier also, that supports Palestine, but at the same time refuses to acknowledge the independence of Tibet. It is clear Chinese money trumps human rights. No wonder then that the human rights of citizens in this country is treated with such contempt. And in fact, Chairperson, if I look at the benches of the ANC, it is proof. Human rights are not serious for the ANC. Voorzitter, daar is geen hoop op een veilige en voorspoedige toekomst voor die burgers van hierdie land as basiese mensenrechte nie voorop staan in die levering van dienste nie. Hoe kan daar sprake wees van mensenrechte as amper 10 miljoen mense werkloos is? Hoe kan daar sprake wees van mensenrechte as mense so moedeloos is om werk te soek dat hulle net eenvoudig opgee? Hulle word verdoemd tot een leven sonder waardigheid. Geen land kan voor en toe beweeg in sulke omstandighede nie. Hoe kan daar sprake wees van een voorspoedige toekomst as die basiese mensenrechte soos vervat in artikel 27 van die grondwet nie nagekom word nie? Wanneer maas met babas op hulle rug kilometers per dag moet stap met emmers om water te gaan haal. Elke keer as ek kind honger gaan slaap is dit die regering wat gefaal het. Elke kind wat in een put toilet by een school sterf is as gevolg van die regering wat nie omgeen nie. Elke keer as een patiënt by een hospitaal weggewees word, omdat daar nie dokters, verpleegpersoneel of medikasie is nie, is dit een faling van die regering om mensenrechte te beskerm. Die gebeure van Life is die Dimeni is een klat op die regering, die ANC, en een bewys van die minachting waarmee die regering die burgers van die land beskou en hanteer. Elke verkrachting, elke moord, en een politie wat gewoon nie kan of wil optree nie, is een skending van basiese mensenrechte. Elke keer as een kind onderwerp word aan swak onderwijs, wat sy toekomst gaan benadeel, misluk die regering om die mensenrechte van daar die kind te beskerm. Die miskenning van ons tale en kultuur, en die talrechte soos vervat in hoofstuk 2 van die grondwet, is een aantasting van ons mensenrechte. Elk een van ons in heemse tale, dit sluit Afrikaans in, het die recht op beskerming. Een taal is veel meer as net een middel tot communicatie. Een taal is jou identiteit. Die verskraling van enige taalrecht is een verskraling van die identiteit van daar die persoon. Maar is duidelik, die ANC regering gee gewoon nie om nie. Ons mensenrechte word in hoofstuk 2 van die grond waar die handvest van mensenrechte verskans. Hierdie hoofstuk is die hoeksteen van ons demokratiese bestel en moet die rugsnoer wees vir die regering. Dit is die een hoofstuk in die grond wet waarin daar nie sonder meer getorring kan en mag word nie. En dis waarom die besluit van die ANC en hulle kornuite, die EFF, met wie hulle so knus saamgewerk het om artikel 25 te wijzig teen hierdie breer context gesien moet word. Elkeen van hierdie mense rechte in hoofstuk 2 word nou blootgestel dier die populistische, politisch gedrewe poging om een van die artikels wat juist socio-economische voorspoed kan bewerkstellig te wijzig. Dit is een deur wat oopgemaak word wat nie weer toegemaak kan word nie. Voorzitter, die beskerming van mense rechte vereist dat die regering respect moet hee vir die mense vir hulle levens en hulle menswaardigheid. Dit is duidelik dat die ANC regering dit nie het nie. En vryheid van spraak is een mensenrecht en weer eens vandag is dit duidelik dat die EFF en die ANC wil besluit wie mag wat sê. Mensenrechte word beskerm en bevorder dier die regering wat vir amal staan, wat amal se belang op jaar dra, 
niet net een zekere groep nie. Daarom kan slechts een partij wat inclusief en divers is, wat gloed dat allemaal gelijke geleentheden moet krijgen, dat allemaal deel is van die land Zuid-Afrika redt. En daar die partij is die DA. Op 8 mei kan ons weer ons mensenrechten voorop stel. Kan ons ons stem voor die partij uitbrengen waar die beginsels van die grondwet zal uitleven en beschermen. Een partij wat mensen saam voor en toe gaan nemen, niet achter toe nie. Stem voor die DA en stem voor in Zuid-Afrika voor allemaal. Honorable Deputy Minister of Higher Education. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, House Chairperson. The, one of the things that I think the sixth parliament will have to consider is the obligatory clapping of hands by members when their fellow members have just spoken, even when they've just been so mediocre, just as the previous speaker has just done, just to prop them up to make them believe that they've done the best that they could. This human rights debate takes place within a global context, context where human rights are being threatened and rolled back. The rise of right-wing extremism in ad is advancing and becoming rampant in certain parts of the world. Our hearts in particular goes out to the victims of the New Zealand terrorism massacre at mosques in Christchurch. The Christchurch attack is indicative of the emboldened right-wing ideology and extremism that is on the rise, but masking itself in various forms, including as political parties that follows a cult-like movement. South Africa cannot pretend that we are immune to this ideology. In fact, many of these ideologues are immune to this ideology. In fact, many of these ideologues draw their inspiration from our past and continue to be motivated by South African right-wing extremists masquerading under the guise of credible organization. If you listen closely to some of the views advanced by the opposition parties on human rights debates, especially for historically marginalized communities, you can almost feel the peppered fragrance of right-wing ideology being advocated. Whilst others are decent enough to sanitize their right-wing extremism with accepted liberal jargon, others are even more overt, especially now that we're headed to elections. We could sample views of some of the political parties on the debates on land or on women emancipation or on employment or even on access to education. Even better, the debate that exposed the schizophrenia within the DA, for instance, which cost the then leader of uh, the uh, 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 parliament in the DA, Lindy Mazibuko, and now uh, Gwen, uh, um, Gwenya at the hands of the macho Helen Ziller and James Salfer. Broad-based black economic empowerment is the viable economic empowerment of all in, in particular women, workers, youth, people with disabilities, and people living in rural areas through diverse but integrated socioeconomic strategies. There has been challenges in the implementation of the policy. It has been riddled with perceptions of corruption or the empowerment for the politically elite and connected. But it has worked and needs to be supported. For instance, the IDC for the past five years approved finance to BEE-empowered companies of 40 billion and supported many black South Africans, I mean many black South Africans as shareholders. The, IS, the IDC has committed a further 25 billion to the Black Industrialist Program, 5.2 billion to youth-empowered enterprises, and a further 9.6 billion to women-empowered enterprises. This is what the DA and the other political parties are opposed to, but are disguising it as a promotion of equal opportunities for all, whereas we know that the foundation from which we all start building can never be equal. The same applies to opposition towards employment equity, where our intention is to achieve equity in the workplace by promoting equal opportunity and fair treatment to the elimination of unfair uh, practices. The workplace is still reflecting the old apartheid days because those who are in control of the economy refuse transformation 
with all their might, and they are getting political support from the likes of the DA and the Freedom Front, as we've heard in this debate. The 2018 Employment Equity Report tells us that white people still occupy 67.7% of top management jobs in South Africa. Blacks only occupy 83.5% of positions at unskilled, at unskilled level. Females occupy 43.5% of semi-skilled jobs. Males occupy 662 in the positions of senior management. Where is the equity in this regard? Yesterday, the Honorable Van Dam tweeted braggingly about how the DA parliamentary caucus will look significantly different from what it had looked like in the fifth parliament because it handed over to the IEC what comprises of 50.5% and wait for it, what she refers to as constitutional blacks. Now I ask myself, what is constitutional blacks? So I thought, I imagined the Honorable uh, Van Damme wearing a mascot branded with the Constitution as a black person. Developed themselves academically and achieved. And I would like to say to all of you, you have been good students. Well done. And those of you who will be going to other areas of your deployment, we want to wish you good as you go. And those that are coming back, be good next time because you may have a speaker that really won't do what Madam Speaker did to be very patient all the time with all of you. Madam Speaker, I give you that platform to say farewell to this house which you have led for the past five years. The Minus Two Club. I see some very bright faces across the room. I shall say no more. Honorable members, uh, sadly, as the day started, we received the news about uh, the loss of one of us, of a child that is the, exactly the same age as our democracy, 25 years taking her own life. Like everybody else who's said words about this occurrence, it's very, very sad. And it's been difficult for the chief whip because he's hardly uh, done away with the pain of losing his mother. And now he has lost a child. But with all of these occasions, you become stronger. And so, chief whip, Ibambe Mfowetu, you can only be stronger because it hasn't killed you yourself. As a parent myself, who has a child uh, that suffers in a particular way, I know that one way or another, Chief Whip has also been a fellow traveler, where we traverse the road of trying to keep the balance in a family and to look after your children and make sure they continue to survive while you carry on with your own life also. So it's one of those things and we wish our chief whip very well under these circumstances. As we have come to the end of an eventful and robust fifth parliament, which he was part of. Honorable members, we've had highs, we also have had lows. But the point is we have survived. We have held our hands because we also had to work together on behalf of our people. So it didn't matter where we came from, but we were all here at the behest of our people out there who expect collectively 
that we will deliver to our country. Over the course of our term, we have marked a number of seminal milestones. Uh, just recently, we, we did celebrate 20 years of our constitution and alongside the celebration of the 20 years, we were also celebrating the 20 years of the second half of parliament, the NCOP. And it is in the course of that year that our colleagues in the NCOP came up with an understanding that maybe we will do better for South Africa if we relook at the arrangements of our parliament in terms of the role of the two houses. In that, when we formed the NCOP 20 years ago, or a little more than 20 years now, we made it do the same things in terms of passing laws as we do in this house, the National Assembly. And the, 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 the attention they paid to this matter in looking at the NCOP has come up with some proposals I think that the sixth parliament must continue to look into. To summarize it, their view was where section 75 issues that are before parliament are concerned, why do we make the second house go all over in looking at those bills exactly the same ground that we cover in this house, when in fact it's a house we created specifically for purposes of looking at provincial issues, as well as municipal level issues and challenges that in fact we have been faced with and to a point where from time to time the NCOP has to go and intervene in provinces uh, through certain sections of the Constitution and the law in terms of uh, Section 100 and 139 and so on. So the proposal in a nutshell is the NCOP must not necessarily have to spend as much time on Section 75 matters as it does on section 76 matters, because section 76 are the issues that we created the NCOP to focus on. That we should make sure in that house, we have very, very skilled people who can assist us in being more seized on an ongoing basis uh, on issues that face provinces and communities in the municipalities. So in this term, we've had the opportunity to take another look at our democracy. Honorable members, this is not a day for very serious speeches, uh, but being a person who hardly speaks in this house, precisely because I'm speaker, you will allow me to say what I need to say. We, we have, of course, prepared the fifth parliamentary uh, legacy report, which we will hand over to the sixth parliament. We did, uh, I'm told, pass well over a hundred laws in this term. I'm surprised because, I mean, as time goes, we no longer have those many laws to pass like we did uh, uh, 25 years ago. But uh, we did, in any case, pass uh, these laws. And as time went, uh, Parliament grew by robustness. And we did uh, become more and more activists and assertive, and some of that showed up when we were forming certain structures and we were doing it through public participation and we did things very 
uh, openly like when we were uh, looking and recruiting uh, for a public protector and the SABC board. On issues of oversight, we are told that we posed over 10,000 questions to the executive in the course of this term. Some of them were, were written, others were questions were, which were posed right here in this house. We did form the Parliamentary Budget Office, which we believe is a very welcome uh, addition to Parliament. And I remember that uh, the four former Honorable uh, Minister of Finance, Ntlantla Nene, was a chairperson of the Finance Portfolio Committee when it was formed. And when he was minister, we reminded him uh, when we were talking to him about the fact that the budget of parliament is inadequate. And one of the structures that we pointed out were suffering and had not been allocated the resources was actually the parliamentary budget office. It's a very important structure. And I think it was correct that it should not report to the Secretary to Parliament, and the law says that. We know that that issue has not quite settled, uh, you know, very, very firmly in the minds of some of the senior management, but we believe it's the correct thing to do. <laughs> but you see, in the way we formed it, remember we said it must service only four committees. Uh, we have to strengthen it so that other portfolio committees can also be serviced by this very important structure. We are still busy trying to replace the director of the parliamentary budget office. We would like to say that we hope the sixth parliament will continue to look at the issues that were left by the late Honorable Kada Asmal in terms of the institutions supporting democracy. Because we did start off in 2014 hoping that we would deal with those recommendations, but we didn't finish that because you know how it is with politics it takes forever to convince one another. Uh, the fifth parliament uh, concluded the task of reviewing the rules. Uh, but there's one or two areas that, in my view, need revisiting. Not so much overalls as it is the Macarapas. <laughs> you see, people on this side of the house are too gentle. Members, this term the assembly also completed a review of the powers, privileges, and immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act. Also, the Money Bills Amendment Procedure and Related Matters Act. These amendments were necessary to clarify certain provisions. As the chairperson of the programming committee, let me commend the whips and parties for their cooperation. Almost all, all uh, decisions taken in the programming committee every Thursday morning uh, were taken by consensus. So we were not always fighting. What about the IFP? All, all, all whips that were participating in the, in the programming committee. Uh, the Sixth Parliament should examine 
how more matters can be debated, especially in terms of committee reports and motions. And also, remember a proposal we agreed on, that is the mini plenaries, so that we can have more debates that are not necessarily about decision making. But just to be able to share ideas and, and debate on things without necessarily having to vote on them, those mini plenaries must be taken forward as, as an important idea. On transparency and ethics, it's a matter that came up at the Speaker's Forum that we believe the Sixth Parliament must take forward. Uh, political parties and members must maintain the highest ethical standards. Uh, for us, one of the high points for the assembly this term was the adoption of legislation to regulate funding for political parties. Transparency is one way in which we can build public confidence in the political system. During this term, the Speaker's Forum established to promote cooperation and best practices across the legislative sector has carried forward a variety of important projects. This has included the development of standards for oversight and public participation. The Forum has also proposed legislation intended to further capacitate the sector, including amendments to the financial management of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act. And on the basis of this act, we formed the Standing Committee uh, uh, to ensure that they keep an eye on how Parliament itself uh, is exemplary in how it uses the money uh, sourced from the fiscus. Honorable members, on the international front, Parliament has played a leading role in the IPU, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the SADC Parliamentary Forum, uh, which matter is now on the agenda of the uh, SADC, uh, the executive, so that the Parliamentary Forum can transform to a regional parliament. We did our international work. I'm sure many honorable members went to conferences abroad based on the portfolio committees in which they participated. I will highlight the visit to Cuba. I see Honorable Singh is nodding his head, and I'm sure Honorable Stianazen, Honorable Chief Whip, if he was here, Deputy Chief Whip, Honorable Shibambu, who's not here right now. We did visit Cuba. Yes, Honorable Waters and I spent many times at the IPU, but I'm now talking about Cuba. <laughs> Suffice to say, there's a lot for us to learn from the way they are so exemplary, especially in two respects their education system, and their health system. Uh, they have a, a near zero illit illiteracy rate. And their health system is the envy of many uh, so-called developed countries. And of course, they help us as South Africa in terms of medical students who are studying there, who have proposed to us that this one year, you know, they study for five years and they spend the last year at home. They are asking that we should leave them in Cuba for that one year as well. Because when they come back to South Africa, they experience many difficulties 
uh, Honorable Minister of, fin of uh, Health, in terms of being absorbed into the system back in South Africa. I also believe, yes, you agree, Honorable Singh, you know. I believe the Chief Whips also had a very fruitful visit to Ghana and the United Kingdom, and I was uh, telling Honorable Stian yes, and I listened to their report, uh, which was debated by the House a few days ago. To come to the people who have helped us, I want to say to the management of parliament, it is with your help that parliament has been getting clean audits year after year. We have a long way to go in terms of adequate resources for us to do our work. Uh, but we know that what money we get from the fiscus, we use very well. Honorable members, whatever other challenges of parliament, we continue to challenge them. We challenge the challenges. So when we come back on the sixth, in the sixth parliament, Soon after the 8th of May, we should continue to deal with those issues. The will of our people will, of course, be expressed on the 8th of May. And let's have a peaceful and successful elections. We wish those that are in the list of their various parties good luck. We Thank those members that are not returning for their service. And we wish you well in your future endeavors, honorable members that don't come back. And let me thank all those who have enabled us to serve our people. First on the agenda is my dear husband. and my family and our families, all of us, the deputy speaker and presiding officers, the president, the ministers and deputy ministers, and a special word of appreciation to my office staff who endeavored to make life easier at all times. Honorable Minister of uh, Mineral Resources. Order. It has been a privilege and an honor to lead our parliament and to serve our people. I thank you very much, honorable members, for our service collectively to our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. One of those things that you led with, Honorable Speaker, with your colleagues in the Speaker's Forum was the commissioning of the high-level panel report which has continued to be made reference in this house and i'm sure it's one of those issues that in your legacy report you will leave to the sixth parliament other members did not understand why honorable waters wanted the speaker to recognize the ipu meeting where they were together because that's the period when he knelt down in the mountain of the Alps and said, will you? <laughs> that's the secret, <laughs> honorable title.
Thank you. This is not just another farewell speech for me. It really is going to be a goodbye. And I've blinked 20 years have gone by, and now it's time for me to find out, as Mario Ambrosini used to say, whether or not there is actually life after Parliament. But just to assure you, I am hoping to prove that there is. <laughs> Nothing I could say today will come close to conveying how incredibly grateful I am for the opportunity I've had to serve the people of South Africa as a member of this National Assembly. It has been an honor and a privilege to work alongside every one of you, members, officials, staff, thank you. The first day I stood at this podium and thank God for this opportunity was the day I met Prof. Ismail Mohammed. He had written me a letter of encouragement and we went on to work together on minerals and energy. Um, and of course that committee was chaired by Duma and Corsi and organized by Tanya Leons who is an official today. And both of these people set the highest standard of excellence in their work which I benefited from. These were just some of my many heroes and mentors over the years who have sat in these benches and served members of parliament and many who sit here today. The first time I encountered Kader Asmo, then Minister of Education, he had called out to me across the old assembly, inviting me to join the Education Portfolio Committee. Unlike Prof Muhammad, a committed Catholic, Prof Asmo was, by his description, a committed humanist. Of course, we bumped heads and exchanged words, which we both enjoyed, and became good friends in the process. Ben Turok, another giant, got my attention by tearing my speech to pieces in those early days in the most eloquent way in a debate. I so wanted to respond with clever cutting words, but managed to remember I would do better to learn from him. And we too became fast friends. I'm also remembering people like Mas Shikani and Alfon Punchani from our days in Zimbabwe in the year 2000 and so many other remarkable people who have left an indelible mark on my life through the years. Committee chairs from Minister Pando and Professor Mayatulo who so wisely prefaced his sentences with the words, seated where I am seated. To Honourable Masango and Honourable Kapu who have been an inspiration and really made me feel like I'm part of <laughs> what's going on here. Speaker Mbeti, in my eyes, a champion of parliamentary oversight at a time when oversight in the ANC was seriously not popular. Also, unlike me, who competed in a man's world by playing down who I was as a female, Speaker Mbeti, by contrast, courageously embraced being a female in every detail in her work. I was at first alarmed, but curious enough to try it. Nothing short of revolutionary. I could go on and on about so many amazing characters like Joan Fubbs, Mike Waters, Kent Durr, Corne Mulder, Honorable Froelich, <laughs> yes, and wait for it, even Jacob Zuma. But I will stop there and I'll write the book instead. I do just have to tell you quickly, though, about my first day ever in committee. I walked in fairly self-conscious. I saw a space on my right between the, a row of white males and feeling a sense of being pigeonholed. I quickly sat in the space on my left, not realizing the seating protocol. I was right in the middle of the majority party. And as they jumped away on either side of me, I realized that my white face was not just a disadvantage, but an offense. In that moment of rejection, I understood something very important. Hateful, angry words and actions often aimed in my direction came from a place where open wounds, rejection, and deep hurts were buried. I knew I had to have the courage to face and hear that pain and not run from it. I grew to love you all, which in some ways made my job easier. In others, so much harder. <laughs> I really did not want to fight with you, but you all love fighting so much. <laughs> I want to thank you. I want to thank my PA, Mongezi Mabungani, who has been a rare treasure, and all the other precious people who work and have worked in our ACDP offices. Thank you also, Steve Swart, Kenneth Mishfule, for bravely putting up with me and allowing me to stretch your patience and your thinking. So much appreciated. Thank you.
And now I leave you with these words, and it's not going to take me too long, but please, Frank Sinatra, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, I so apologize that I'm differently abled when it comes to singing. There are many, many crazy things that will keep me loving you. And with your permission, may I list a few. The way you wear your hat, the way you sip your tea. <laughs> you can sing for me. The memory of all that. No, no, they can't take that away from me. The way your smile just beams, the way you sing off key, the way you haunt my dreams. No, 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 they can't take that away from me. One last sentence verse. We may, not, we may or may not meet again on that bumpy road of life. Still, I'll always, always keep the memory of the way you have your say, the way you, we dance till three, the way you changed my life, no, no, they can't take that away from me. No, they can't take that away from me. <laughs> Honorable Corne Mulder, I was going to ask you to sing it for me, but I uh, decided we wouldn't have time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I love you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Dudley. I hope if you checked your monitor, you'll realize I didn't even want to disturb. You had extra two minutes. And uh, I'm just asking those who are coming, please, please, those who are coming, check your monitor. I don't want to stop anybody today. I'm not ready to stop anybody. Honorable Carter. Thank you, Speaker. Chairperson, today I'm really going to refer to, to our Madam Speaker. At our last sitting of each year, we, our Speaker, afforded an opportunity to bid each farewell and season greetings. But today's farewell is different. It represents an end to this fifth parliament. The end of year platitudes will thus not suffice. We need some introspection, as hard as it may be. And I read from a poem called the man in the mirror. When you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king, of, king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He is the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you clear to the end. And you've passed your most difficult, dangerous test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. I would like to think that Parliament and this House, the National Assembly in particular, sits at the apex of our constitutional democracy. We are, after all, elected to represent the people and to ensure government by the people. On introspection, our mirror as the fifth Parliament reflects in the sorry and deteriorating state of our nation and its governance. Our final reward reflects, Speaker, as heartache and tears. Today's sitting represents the end of my second term. It's been a humbling, onerous journey. It was made possible my by my family, like Claire in the audience, Primrose, Namise and Roche. My hope, Speaker, is that we stabilize and recover from the growing calamity that we face in this country. To my fellow citizens, I say, you hold the key to our future. It's your vote. Use it. I do hope that future parliaments will, better be, will be better resourced and capacitated, given our mandate and central role in our democracy. Honourable members, can you allow the honourable member to finish? My add that I am first and foremost beholden to the people of South Africa, those who put their trust firstly in our party and us as individuals, as the 400 people sitting here today. 
affording us the opportunity to serve as servants of a people. I'm indebted and grateful to our caucus staff. My sincere appreciation goes to Parliament staff, all of you, from those in the restaurants, housekeeping, administration, table, committee and support services, the researchers and legal and legislative advisors. I acknowledge and share Order, your concerns and members, hope please. that a fairer, more caring and progressive working environment will become the norm. To our K-9 unit, you hold a very special place in my heart. To my colleagues, all of you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm sure that we will all at some stage all have occasions to reflect on the man in the glass and on our well-being or distress as a nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Kata. Ahbaralit Murdoch. Honourable Chairperson, what we are experiencing today just indicates that in the end, although we are politicians from different political parties, we are all just human beings with our families, with emotions, with our own feelings. And we should, re should respect that. I want to start off by referring to the tragedy that besets the family of the Honorable Chief Whip, Mr. Jackson Tembu, the Honorable Jackson Tembu. What happened in that family today, can we, can we even imagine what they are going through today? I'm also a father of two daughters. My one daughter is 25, and I can just imagine how they are experiencing this today. I want to just come with a quote in that respect by Gloria Vanderbilt, and she says the following in this respect. She says, I have heard it is said that the greatest loss that a human being can experience is the loss of a child. This is true. It does not just change you, it demolishes you. It is, the, is the pain less? No, just different. It is there forever till the day you die. I would like to express on behalf of Freedom Front Plus our sincere condolences to the Honorable Chief Whip and his family. The Honorable Minister of Energy, you are not doing your party proud at this moment. You are not doing your party proud at this moment. You are making fun of this. You have just now made fun of the Honorable Carter. I was going to ignore that. It is an absolute disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. Uh, point of order, Chair. Point. Honorable uh, Mulder, will you please take your seat? Yes, Honorable Minister. Honorable uh, Chair, actually what uh, uh, Honorable Mandasha was doing was not what he thinks it was. Okay, can we... And for him to be pointing a finger like that at him, and telling us he's not doing our party right. Honourable. There's absolutely nothing that Honourable Mandashe did. Thank you, Actually, Honourable you Minister. Withdraw that. Honourable Minister, thank you. You know, today is the last day. Let's all respect each other, please. Honourable Mulder, will you please continue with your speech? Thank you, ma'am. Honourable Minister of Small Enterprises, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. Honourable you, Mulder. No. No. Honourable Milda, please, can you pl leave the issue behind and continue? We're trying to be as yes. calm as possible. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Continue. Let's, let's do Honourable that. Chairperson? I'd rather... Honourable Chairperson. Honourable, yes, Honourable Member. We, 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 we need to put it on record. Actually, Honourable Mandashe said to us sitting here as the... We, uh, Whips on duty. Honourable member, I can't cannot. hear the member. Yes. He even said it's inhuman to allow somebody to cry and not attend to it. He was so touched by it. And he came to us one by one. And what we were trying to do was not to disturb Honourable okay. Carter in her speech. Yeah. I hear you, I Honourable wish member. Honourable Mulder could have known the what humility of Honourable Mandash. I hear he you. He will regret what he just said. Okay. I hear you, Honourable Mulder. Thank you, ma'am. Honourable members, please allow me. Allow me to chair. Honourable Stenhazen, please. Honourable Mulder, please continue. 
Uh, as it was explained, you didn't know why honorable member was here, but I don't want to go into that. I want you to go into the farewell speech. Thank, Thank you. you. Ma Thank you, ma'am. We are at the end of the fifth parliament, and it was a tumultuous parliament. We've, we experienced many things, good and bad. And now we are going away, and we're going into the election. And some of us will return, and some of our parties will return. And if there's one thing today that I would like to ask from all of us. House Chair, just order. Can we ask the honorable member brandishing cameras there to please desist from doing that? It's not allowed in the house. What's happening? Yeah. He's, uh, he's taking pictures that the gentleman seated there, honorable member. Okay, honorable members, please, please let's, re let's respect the house. Uh, you know the rules. I'm not going to go back to the rules. You know that's not allowed. Please continue, honorable Melda. Thank you, ma'am. The one thing I would like to ask all of us, when we return in the sixth parliament, let all of us continue to make us and the electorate out there proud of this institution called Parliament. The people are looking up to us as leaders in this country and to, to represent them. And therefore it's absolutely important that we uplift the image of this institution. And we've succeeded in the last couple of months and maybe the last year or so to do so. Let's continue to do that. In the limited time I've got left, I would like to say thank you to all my colleagues, those who are retiring. I wish you well in your retirement. For those that come back, when we come back, our parties are important, but the interests of our country and the people are a little bit more important than our own personal, factual uh, interests. So I want to say thank you to each and every one of us. I would like to end off on my own behalf with that quote, I think it's Terminator, that says, I'll be back. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you, Honorable Mulder. Honorable Nkwankwa. House Chair, Honorable Members and Fellow South Africans, for those of you who are artistic with words, writing farewell speeches is easy peasy. However, for the rest of us who are unremarkable with words, such speeches are no mean feat. Due to this weakness, I have unavoidably used William Shakespeare as my crutch in thanking you by borrowing his words when he says, and I quote, I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks, end quote. Honorable members, it has been a privilege for me personally and for us in the United Democratic Movement working with you over the past five years. Special thanks go to all my colleagues in the WIPARI, the Executive Authority of Parliament, presiding officers, our caucus staff members, and all the parliamentary employees who have served us diligently for what has been a remarkable five years. Thank you very much indeed, I'm much obliged to you. As I bid you farewell, my heart is filled with dialectical emotions which are best captured by the self-explanatory words of William Shakespeare from the play Romeo and Juliet, where he writes, parting is such sweet sorrow. As we part ways, we should take pride in having demonstrated utmost respect for the magnitude of the work we entrusted by our people at the beginning of the term. In 2014, we knuckled down and worked hard to, one, make laws that will improve the lives of our people, debate government policies, play an oversight role over the work of government, among other issues. I'm sure most of you will agree with me when I say it has been a five years full of fun times, challenging times, and everything in between. Yes, there were instances where we had, where we might not have covered ourselves in glory. For that, we should request the citizens of our country to grant us atonement. However, even as in those difficult moments, I can confidently say that most of us never lost sight of the bigger picture of building a South Africa where we all look forward to the sunrise of our tomorrow. Nevertheless, in the final analysis, it is up to South Africans to judge who among us have been the vanguards of their democracy and who among us have handled their affairs in a cavalier way. To you, my fellow South Africans, it has been a privilege, a great privilege to serve you. Colleagues, I also wish to take this moment to wish all of you the best for the forthcoming elections. We go to these elections fully cognizant of the fact that some of us will be re-employed for another five-year term, while some of us will not make it back. Whatever the outcome, we must be ready to accept the will of the people. To those of you who will not come back, good luck with all your future endeavors. In conclusion, as we traverse the sometimes challenging and often difficult road to elections, 
We call on leaders and politicians to exercise maximum restraint and show tolerance. Confident of and assured by the presence of the spirit of our forebears as we trudge on to elections, badly battered by our seemingly stubborn social pathologies, which are by no means insurmountable, I invoke the words of former President Thabo Mbeki in his farewell speech to former President Nelson Mandela delivered in this very house in 1999 when he said, we have you, Madiba, as our nearest and brightest star to guide us on our way. We will not get lost. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Mkwankwa. Honorable members, before I call on Honorable Kubisa, as I will be leaving this chair after he speaks, I just want to say to honorable members that uh, from the International Fora or the PGIR, we want to thank all the members of this house for being the good ambassadors for the Parliament of South Africa. From all the uh, delegations that represented us in International Fora, the message we got on their return is that they all went out as a South African parliament and not as parties. And I can attest to that as the convener of the IPU, and I wish to thank all the conveners of all the focus groups. And we hope that in the sixth parliament, you will have mini plenaries because most of the issues that are discussed at international fora are not for decisions, but so that members are aware of how, what our members are doing in their engagement outside. Thank you for representing the Parliament of South Africa when you are out there and not parties. Thank you very much. Now I will call Honorable Kubisa. Uh, thank you very much, House Chairperson, Honorable Members. This is yet another monumental day in the history of the National Assembly. It's indeed an awesome day. We have come to the end of the Fifth Parliament. It has been a journey of hard work, resilience, discipline, focus, and we had both highs and lows. In spite of all that has happened, all of us came here with the resolve to serve our people and bring pride to the electorate as we pass laws that change their lives for the better. Like Apostle Paul, we say today we have run the race and we have kept the faith. We say this based on the understanding that there are still more mountains to climb, as Madiba said. The masses of our people have not yet received total liberation because they don't have economic liberation. It is at this moment, on behalf of my leader, the Honorable Vizet Kamakwaza Msibi, that I wish to convey my heartfelt gratitude to the presiding officers all honorable members, the table staff, the chief whips, and staff members we rub shoulders with during the past five years. It has been indeed an enriching experience. It was informative and educative. As we look back, we cherish the incisive ideas that were engendered and cultivated in this house as we discussed laws and bills, as we conducted oversight of the executive, and as we engage in debate and other platforms of a dialectic discourse. We may not have achieved it all, but it was good that at times we had to fight on the altar of ideas, we had to agree to disagree, which I believe is the cornerstone of any discourse. We came out better than before. We have learned a lot from one another. I have personally learned a lot through interacting and engaging with you colleagues. There is a lot that the Fifth Parliament has achieved. There are so many laws that we have passed. There are so many inquiries that we have set up. There are so many oversights that we've conducted. And of course, the aim was to put our country on the right track through these inquiries. This parliament gained and restored its image and respect in the hearts and the minds of the entire populace. We are not done yet. We have men of our youth who have qualifications, but they're on the street. We still have women and children who are raped every day. Crime is still a major issue. And the disrespect, disrespect of law and order in certain circles of our society is the order of the day. House Chairperson, so as we part today and go out there for the elections, let us conduct ourselves with respect and dignity. Let us tolerate one another 
so that we have free and fair elections. Let there be no bloodshed in our country uh, at this very important time in the history of our democracy. We are masters of our own destiny, hence we need to deal decisively with any culture of entitlement that some of our people are still imbued in. With, let us not ban and destroy schools, libraries, lab laboratories, and administrative buildings of our country. Let us teach the upcoming generation to seize the moment and work hard to change their own destiny. Let us inculcate in them the spirit of self-help and self-reliance. Let us teach them to maximize their potential and assert their self-esteem. I hope the next parliament will intensify every opportunity to deal with fraud and corruption. It is our duty and responsibility to lift up those of us who cannot lift up themselves. Let us skill and upskill our people to meet the demands of the fourth industrial revolution. It was indeed the best of times. It was the worst of times. It's only on a day when South Africans will have plenty of jobs, booming businesses, literate majorities, and minimized poverty and inequality that we would say we have achieved. Other than that, the struggle continues. Aluta continua. Thank you so much. The Honorable Singh. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, firstly, let me al uh, allow me on behalf of my leader, Prince Butelezi, and caucus to express our most sincere condolences to the Chief Whip of the Majority Party, the Honorable Jackson Mtembu, and his family on the sudden and tragic loss of his daughter, Ms. Kwezi Mtembu. Honorable Mtembu, you and your family remain in our thoughts and prayers. Honorable Speaker, when the Honorable Minister of Defense and Military Veterans spoke earlier on in the debate on human rights, and when you also delivered your farewell message, Honorable Speaker, you said, but she said, listen to your children. Mm. And this begs the question of the role of us as members of Parliament, inside and outside of Parliament, and what communities who we represent expect of us. Are we expected to be available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Do we give ourselves enough time officially to take leave and spend that time with our family? Many of us in this House, Honorable Speaker, have challenges with family members, with relatives, with friends. But really, do we have the time because of the pressures that are brought to bear on us by our political parties, by this parliament, by our constituents, to deal with that. I think that is something that we earnestly need to look at in the sixth parliament, particularly for our colleagues, the women in this house, many of whom have young children and have to look after those children and care for those children. And I've seen, Honorable Speaker, young children left alone in Acacia Park when their members of parliament uh, mothers have, have to go out on constituency work. What happens to those young children? We know about drug problems and all other problems in our parks. We blame our children, we blame everybody else, but let us introspect. And that is a message from me for us to really look at in the sixth parliament. Having said that, Honorable Speaker, it goes without saying that South Africa had arguably for the first time since the dawn of our democracy witnessed its most robust and, at times, unparliamentary parliament. It is a, certainly a story to be remembered. Mm. Whether good, bad, ugly, or just a tall story, it is now inscribed not only in the Hansard, but also deeply etched into the national psyche of this nation. Mm. This fifth parliament has witnessed members being physically removed on more than one occasion, it has witnessed the election of two presidents in one term. It has had a sauna postponed and then hurriedly reinstated. It has seen the parliamentary precinct overrun by angry students in protest of the promised feasible false statement, and police respond with stun grenades and tear gas. Members have come and gone, 
and cabinet shuffles have been a regular occurrence, and as we speak, the lights have all but gone out upon our national grid. Honorable Speaker, grand corruption is evident, unfortunately, in many of our departments and entities, and hard-earned taxpayer money remains under siege. VAT has been increased, and the fuel price is at almost 20 rand per litre. Honorable Speaker, these are the stories we can tell, the ones that we have all personally witnessed and continue to witness as this fifth parliament term draws to an end. It will now be up to the voters, who is the final democratic check and balance in any democracy, to decide if he or she wants more of the same or a new and better story for the future of this country to be written. And this decision will be made on the 8th of May. On a po more positive note, uh, Madam Speaker, though, this Parliament has also successfully passed legislation which will undoubtedly improve the lives of South Africans. We are proud to say that the IFP's introduced medical innovation bill came to fruition with the Department accepting a bill that allows uh, cannabis for medicinal use. And as we move forward, we'll look at other items like hemp and other products with the Department of Trade and Industry. Speaker, this Parliament has witnessed the forging of strong relationships across party lines with representatives from all parties who are striving together for the common good of this country. We hope these continue and that we build upon such relationships and take our country forward. We have had members of now this House time has expired. and the administration Having who are given called you to two rest. More minutes, Madam Speaker, I say time has definitely to those expired. who have been called to rest, bless their souls. Thank you very much and good luck to everybody. The Honorable Paulson. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, the presiding officer, officers, members of the ruling party, members of the opposition, commissars and members of the economic freedom fighters. Of the utmost regard for all of you, many of you, your sacrifices, your contribution to democracy. And although we may have disagreed robustly, and I think we must not um, forget that Whoever you disagree with, someone's father, someone's mother, someone's sister, someone's brother, and we must never dehumanize people, and we have failed, I humbly apologize. This EFF has served this beautiful country while the ANC has led it. When the economic freedom fighters contested the 2014 elections, a few months after its launch on the 26th of July 2013, very few of you, if any at all, thought of the eventuality of us being the dominant voice of this fifth parliament, a voice that has resonated not just with marginalized and working class, but with all those who are now beginning to believe that we Africans can steer our lives towards a better tomorrow, a brighter future. We remain unapologetic in our approach as black and as African people. We are not another ANC whose 1917 constitution starts, starts off as we, the loyal subjects of the British Empire. But fast forward to 2019, and the ANC does not surprise us when they come here and speak glowingly about a Chief Whip's visit to the UK and how they want to even strengthen how we simulate the customs and practices of that parliament. There is not a week that goes by that South Africans will not be subjected to a quotation of some or other British author. Africans must entrust their futures with people who are not ashamed of their Africanness. In his book, Things Fall Apart, Chenua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist, writes, the white man is very clever. He came quietly and peaceably with his religion. We are, were amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. Now he has won our brothers and our clan can no longer act like one. He has put a knife on things that Order. held us together and we have fallen apart from both the majority and the current official opposition. We have heard these words uttered, the EFF spy in the sky 
policies. Yesterday, yesterday again, Uncle Ibrahim Patel uttered those words. Uncle Ibrahim, look at our contribution to humanity as Africans. Hamilton knocked his first heart transplant in the laboratories of Grootenskeer Hospital. Don't forget that to say so farewell. many people another chance at a productive life. Let's look back even further. 13th century Mali boasted impressive cities like Timbuktu with grand palaces, mosques and universities. Order, the first order, gold one mine. Of the in Swaziland, carbon dating back 43,000 years. You don't want to hear about Africa's contribution to human advancement. I am not surprised. South Africa is at a crucial crossroads, given where we are politically, socially, and economically. And in terms of the morale of our people, the people of our country feel defeated, powerless, invisible, disrespected by the very people they entrusted with our national assets, our well-being and our futures. We as the economic freedom fighters know this. In the past six years, that is where we have been. In the villages, in our communities, in our institutions of higher learning, among the working class, fighting side by side with them for lives of dignity. We will continue to fight for them in a way that only we are courageous enough to. So as many have referred to the EFF manifesto as pie in the sky, have you considered that your response is within your current frame of what's possible and how you perceive the challenges, not to mention limited assumptions about the passion and willpower of the average man in the street? Have you considered that you undervalue, underestimate the power of solidarity and willpower of the people to live in our context, the country with the greatest level of inequality in the world, thanks to you, mainly. I appeal to fellow South Africans, young, old, from every walk of life, to open your hearts, your minds, and your spirit, to embrace a new way of thinking, a new way of being, to a society defined by solidarity and hard work, where a spirit of equality Honorable and humanity person. reigns supreme, and entrust the economic freedom fighters with your vote on the 8th of May 2019. Honorable Goodbye, AMC. Goodbye, you very much. EFF. Mandla. The Honorable Chief Whip of the Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me begin by extending our deepest condolences to the Right Honourable Jackson Mtembu, the Government Chief Whip, and his family on the tragic loss that they suffered in the early hours of yesterday. There can be nothing that prepares a parent for the loss of a child. It is a complete reversal of the natural order. And in times of tragedy, it's sometimes good to turn to the writings of the ancient Greeks and in this instance, the writings of Aeschylus. And I quote, and even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Oh, the honorable members. No, Hello, hello, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. On what point are you rising? I'm going to send you a part. I'm going to send you a part. Please take your seat, Honorable Member. Honorable Members, please, can we respect the House? Can we just respect this last sitting in this term? Please proceed, Honorable Stian Eze. The Chief Whip and his family remain in our thoughts and prayers at this difficult time. And just like that, here it is, the end of the Fifth Parliament. And so, Madam Speaker, to you, I start with a confession. It was the first sitting of the Fifth Parliament, and the Honourable Waters and I had newly been installed into the office of Chief Whip and Deputy Chief Whip, respectively. And uh, the order paper duly arrived at our office, and uh, much to our horror, 
There were about 16 or 17 items on the order paper for which we had not prepared speakers. Well, you can imagine the set of an absolute panic in the Chief Whip's office, running around, phoning members, telling them to urgently prepare speeches with two hours to go before the House sat. And we ran around like that for about 30 to 40 minutes before one of the staff members in my office put us out of our misery when they pointed out that 17 of those items were below the line. <laughs> You never stop learning in Parliament, and I think that's one of the great things. No matter how much you think you know the rules, no matter how much you think you know the traditions, you learn something new every single day. And I think it's been a tumultuous five years, but I think it's also been an exciting five years. I think it's been an interesting five years. Yes, there's been a number of negatives. One of my greatest regrets is to see the violence that has permeated Parliament, the use of fists rather than the force of argument. Madam Speaker, you've spoken about ethics, and I think that you were right to do so. And I, one, I think that the biggest disappointments for me was to watch how the ethics committee in this fifth parliament collapsed, and it's something which we need to ensure uh, is re-established very firmly in the sixth parliament to ensure that we can have the ethics and accountability by members of which you speak about. Ministerial accountability is also important. And I think there were far too many ministers who were absent for oral questions, who have not responded to written questions, and the attendance for important matters of being able to bring the people's business to the floor of Parliament, members' statements, motions, etc., has been very, very poor. I think our legislative agenda and the way in which we introduce, process, and get through legislation needs a complete overall into the Fifth Parliament. We've passed 100 bills, as you've said. I think this is probably one of the lowest legislative outputs mm -hmm. since post-democratic uh, Parliament was established. And it is one of our key constitutional obligations, and I think it's a matter that's going to require. I also think there's been far too much focus in the fifth parliament on processing the business of the executive, and far too little attention focused on processing the people's business, the work that comes through from committees, from constituencies, uh, making it to the floor of this house. But warts and all, I think that the fifth parliament has done a number of excellent things. I think it has re-established this House as the arena of executive accountability. It has again become the crucible of the national debate. It is no longer the boring place where people tune out on or tune into when they're trying to get to sleep at night. People are excited to see what's happening in Parliament. They're excited to see the debate, and that's a good thing. The more of our people that we can involve in our process, get interested to see how this House can be used as an instrument for their aspirations and their dreams, the better it's going to be for us, establishing truly a people's parliament. We've also had some great highlights. We saw off a president. Now, with DA, as you know, put on eight motions of no confidence before it became fashionable to do so. But nonetheless, I think at the end of the day, one of the highlights that will stand out for me is that day in which we closed the chapter on the Zuma era and started to write a new chapter for our country. To my members in the DA, it's been a real privilege to serve as the chief whip of our caucus, to work with the 89 brave men and women who've sat on these opposition benches, leading the debate, putting the people's business forward. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your work and the support that you've shown us. I want to say thank you to the chief whips of all parties. I think the chief whips forum and the programming committee particularly have been centers of excellence in this parliament where the partisan rancor has been able to be parked to one side and we have come together to act in the best interests of a parliament and the people. No parliament, no place like this can operate without some measure of cooperation between parties. And it must be something we nurture and foster going forward to ensure that our parliament works better and gets through its work. So thank you to all of those who've played their role in that. I think that the sixth parliament is going to offer a number of challenges. And we've got to learn from the things that we've experienced and the lessons in this fifth parliament. They mustn't be lost. They must be carried forward into the sixth parliament. I think we're going to have to resist, certainly in this next parliament, a retreat from parliament into a far more executive style of office as the executive starts to try to claw back some of the ground uh, that this parliament has been able to make in the fifth parliament. And we must resist that as members of parliament with all that we have. We've got to keep this place as that arena of executive accountability. I also think that there's far more work that we can do in terms of oversight. And whilst both the Honourable Dedeza and the Speaker have mentioned the high-level panel report, 
I think that the high-level panel report should actually be a low point for Parliament. Because essentially what that panel went out and did is the work that we as members of Parliament should have been doing over the course of this last period. We should have been testing the legislation that we've offered. And I definitely think that we need to ensure that there's greater synergy between what we do here and the National Council of Provinces, where we don't turn the upper house into a mini NA, but rather unleash them to be able to do the work that they need to do, particularly that oversight. But for me, the biggest question is simply this, as I stand here at this podium on notionally the last day of the fifth parliament, is that should we really be rising today at all? Our country today is facing a massive crisis. Load shedding is posing, I think, one of the biggest risks to our economy and to our advancement as a people going forward. None of the targets that we've set committees, none of the lofty ideals that the president outlined in the SONA, none of those ambitious programs and policies are going to come to anything if the lights are off, the factories are closed, and the shops are shut. It means waiters and waitresses who don't have restaurants open. It means factory workers who are going to be put onto short time. We should not be going home. We should be keeping this parliament open until we've got answers to this crisis. There's things we can be doing. We could be passing the ISMO bill. We could be amending legislation to unleash uh, solutions for this electricity crisis. The people are looking to us for leadership. And I think it's wrong that the people's house is going to, the lights are going to be off here in the people's house when we should be lighting that uh, way forward for our nation as the people's representative. <laughs> now yesterday the president unveiled the values uh, on the steps and I hope all members have seen them. Freedom and democracy, equality and diversity, unity and reconciliation, openness and participation, oversight and accountability, reconstruction, development, and cooperative governments. And I think they're a great new addition to our precincts. And as we descend the steps as we leave today, we must reflect on our shortcomings. Have we really lived up to every one of those values over the course of the last five years? But as we ascend those steps, when we return into the sixth parliament, we must every day work as hard as we can to internalize them to carry them through into everything that we do, whether it's in a committee or in the plenaries or in many plenaries as we're going to be having. Are we living up to those values? Are we placing those values that proudly adorn the steps now of the NA and the NCOP in the work that we do as the people's representatives? So the chief whips of all parties, thank you very much for cooperation. Madam Speaker, I know we've had our moments, but it's really been great fun working with you and getting to know you over the course of the last five years. And um, I think we leave today a bit friendlier than we were when we started in the fifth parliament so i look forward to going to cuba again with you to the chamber staff the na table uh, um, all the uh, people who work behind the scenes thank you for the work that you do on a daily basis making this wonderful institution work this is a special place and we're all so proud and privileged to serve here in the last five years it really is an honor and so we look forward to seeing you after the election where we come back bigger, bolder, braver, and stronger than ever before. Farewell. The Honorable Deputy Chief Whip. Nyabonga Somlomo Walendlo. Ankale Ngogunzulisa Emavi Endwututo Emdenini Wagam Tembo Umden Waga Chief Whip. Mukshio in Votaratia Bo Quezi Nesisugu Lessingaga, Sitsugubo, Bomtembo, Vutu, Awesanga Lilinesi, Ninga Sabi, Ningetugi, Mobanga Loglo Wendegile, Abushogus Unkunukulu, Unshile, Gepa Unani, Futsu Uyan Sanza, Sinani M Kulewin, Nimela Begnene, Enza Win La Pobe Fanelugume Corner Chief Whip. Njonga bekfane lugu bengu ya loge ndale le farewell speech na me matolo ayakrega mabanjenge mtali gupsungu bana um umtali alasegelo umdona kenge simule simso kepa ingosi itasneta stakona gusi skube gusilkete le lang angluli se futsi gumalunga we ANC gusi lugu besikleli le chifui pukeli le gusi askube gena ko namusa. 
in his honor. Gules kasi lese abu gane nasu. Songe atemba gote stau vise samas kubeka. Somlomo, as we close the curtain of the fifth parliament and taking the the last 25 years of our democracy into account. We must be proud of the road we have traveled as a country. Today, South Africa is indeed a better country than what it was in 1994. And it is even better than what it was when we arrived in this parliament in 2014. As a legislative arm of the state, we have had a very successful term of office where our parliamentary democracy was tested and strengthened. As our democracy is maturing, the people of South Africa have over the past five years taken a keen interest in our work as parliamentarians, thereby rightfully holding us accountable. We have seen massive interest in our legislative and public uh, participation processes. We have had marches to parliament and protests. All these actions of popular struggle by the masses of our people are indicative of a working and fully functioning parliament within the context of a maturing democracy. As the ANC, we are particularly proud of the fact that we have been able to improve the lives of our people through passing very historic and progressive legislations. We can applaud ourselves as the collective of the legislators for having processed 107 pieces of legislations from 2014 to date. Among these is the historic national uh, minimum wage bill, which set the wage floor of 20 rand per hour, thus improving the wages and living conditions of 6 million uh, workers who earn slave wages, which are far below the prescribed national minimum wage. Another historic piece of legislation passed in this term of parliament is the political party funding. Africa. Sanza go show foods you could see, see passes in a lane of foods to umteto, with financial matters amendment bill, later when I go to Hulmende Abenel Banglake, a lailing egg a foods he lizuze, lizuze say in a Hulmende Pelagepa, a bandula in South Africa. Spins a foods is passes in umteto with public audit amendment bill, law empower auditor general good say. So, the committee, the Constitutional Review Committee, the Lila, but Mva Gogubai ANC, the National Conference, yayo CSA, Shogutse, Umtaba, Aubele, Ebandwini, and a panel we na peteli swa. So CSA ba na lelo committee lelo, the Lila hamba is South Africa yonke. Lenda lao ma public participation, sabuya foods, sabesa siba foods ne ado committee. Legungi yo leito buge, leito buga, ito biegeta. I um set us away to the section twenty five. Late of Umeda would say, A C. Buisele Umsaba Ebanduini, Jungoba E. Fanele, one John John and Sasia Watlock, Savalil Sanagot of Naskumbutan. A good logo, Uye Wago Shoge, U Hulumende Lopetung ANC, Namunga Meli Washoge would say, Umsaba Lopetung Hulumende. Uta ukulula for human uh, settlement purposes. Jongo basati kutsugune bandu la basheti ema plazini. Eti emslabe ni lupetwe bandu ma, in, ma, ma private pro properties. Laba nga vumela gaya nga kona kutsu hulumende anga leta tinsita akele bandu tindlu. Eh, Sugbonile njongo basamba sikangasa. 
leto tinza uti kona gepa ukona mshaba wa hulumende lo sheti la pasitu lo mshaba njongo wa ashito mungameli au kulu uluwe guze bandu bagiti bato kona guzi ba usebindi seba kelewe tindlu bafagelewe emandi bafagelewe na kezi guze skubege siye embeli one of this uh, parliament's many watershed moments in the last five years was the adoption of the implementation of the of the new and overall rules of the national assembly the adoption of the new rules was culmination was the culmination of a lengthy process intended to enhance the governance of the business of the house and to align it firmly with the constitution with the constitution current conventions and practices we tighten the rules of debates and rules of conduct of members in the House to ensure consistency and order during the sittings of the House. We are witnesses to what have been happening in this House for the past uh, five years. We don't have to rehash that. It is for the first time since this democratic parliament was convened in 1994 that parliament has a has an avenue to remove any person who acts in a gross disorderly manner using the rules. This ensures that the Parliament of the Republic of South Africa maintains its dignity as the legislative arm of the state representing the people of South Africa. Moving forward, we must, we must as a country, start to prepare ourselves for the, for the, sixth, uh, for the next five years and we must start with an architecture of our, our next parliament. We must start thinking about the kind of new parliament we would like to have, what kind of infra infrastructure it must have, the culture and proceedings we want to introduce and where its location ought to be. Our current infrastructure uh, does not adequately cater for our needs as a legislative arm of state. Joint sittings of the two houses of parliament are impractical due to the space constraints Often committee rooms are not big enough for us to hold meetings and host members of the public for public hearings. The institution is also forced into leasing space from nearing hotels at exorbitant costs. The discussion around the location of the seat of parliament, as previously announced, must be concluded. The financial resources uh, used to fly MPs and members of the executive and their support staff in and out of Cape Town on a weekly basis could, in the long run, be redirected towards the delivery of services for our people. Our parliament must also have better offices. We have a responsibility to build this parliament to be consistent with our democracy, including our restrooms. During apartheid, parliament was meant for males, white males to be precise. As a democratic state, we thus have the responsibility to build a gender sensitive uh, parliament. A parliament which recognizes the needs for child rearing facilities for members of parliament who are caregivers. For Parliament to do its oversight work adequately, it must have world-class research, legal and other professional capacity assisting committees of Parliament with content in order for the oversight work uh, not to depend on those we are overseeing. We must have an independent ability of, to do oversight over the executive. This requires adequate investment in human resources. Therefore, the manner in which Parliament is funded as an arm of state must also seriously be, re be reviewed. On behalf of the Office of the Chief Whip, we thank the ANC for having given us the opportunity to learn, grow and lead. We also thank the members of the ANC Parliamentary Caucus for their support. Our Thursday caucus meetings were characterized by robust debates and sharp political engagements. Though sometimes we differed, we differed on political matters, we remained true to the policies of our glorious movement. The task to lead in the ANC is never one which is carried out by one individual. Hence, in the ANC, we do not have I in our voc voc vocabulary. We speak of we precisely because we have an approach an appreciation that the collective takes precedence over the individual. We therefore thank our comrades in the different leadership uh, structures of our caucus for their collective support, wisdom, and dedication in service of our movement and the, and the people of our country. We thank comrades in the political committee of caucus, 
led by the speaker, the, the ANC strategy, our WIPs and chairpersons committee and ANC study groups. We also thank our colleagues from other political uh, parties for their comradely and over the past uh, five years. Our engagement in the Chief Whips Forum, the National Assembly Programming Committee meetings, and even the chamber floor have always been honest and robust. I therefore thank my colleagues from the other parties who regularly participated in the Chief Whips Forum, ensuring that we collectively go about the business of parliament through consultations and consensus. Though we, are all carry, we, though we all carried a different political mandate, it has been through our collective efforts that parliament has been, functioning, has been a functioning uh, parliament. Over the past five years, some amongst us have fallen prey to cheap political point scoring, stands often leading to totally unacceptable and parliamentary, unparliamentary behavior. Those who will be fortunate enough to be given another opportunity to return to parliament as public representatives must always remember that you are not representing your jacket, but the electorate who gave you a political mandate to be here. We thank the executive leadership of parliament as led by Speaker Mbete in the National Assembly and Metandi Modise in the National Air Council of Provinces for having demonstrated astute leadership over the past five years. The exceptional leadership of these two outstanding women bears testimony to the saying that Watinta Bafazi, Watinta Imbogoto. Uh, though our conduct as MPs has sometimes given our presiding officers gray hairs, they continue to conduct themselves in the most professional manner. Over and above our sharp contradictions as parties, we have also had funny moments in the last five years. We remember humorous moments such as Honorable Member Withdraw Delela and Honorable Member, I do not recognize you. Where do you come from? Uh, which have become social media jokes with the faces of our presiding officers. We can also be proud that our parliament was this week uh, featured in the, international, uh, in the internationally acclaimed The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, where Trevor relayed his experience of receiving warm welcome when he visited our parliament as, as the president's uh, guest. As parliamentarians, we are nothing without the support of the individuals who are employed in our political party caucuses and parliament, and parliament as an institution. We thank the hard-working patriots who have served this parliament with absolute distinction. We want to especially thank the staff of the ANC parliamentary caucus, who are the bedrock of the ANC in parliament. We would not have had all these achievements had we not had a dedicated cadership serving the movement here in parliament. As this parliament rises today, we rise missing 19 members whom we started this journey with, uh, who, who started this journey with us five years ago. May we rise for a moment of silence, honorable speaker, to remember Umamunosi Pontuanambi, ANC and COP, Dr. Mario Ab Ariani Ambrosini, D uh, IFP, Yolanda Puota, ANC, Sakudi Nkwana, ANC, Minister Collins Shabane, ANC, Eugene F uh, von Brandes, DA, KS Mubu, DA, Raisibe Yunis Nyalungo, ANC, Bonsile Nesi, ANC, Trevor Bonomi, ANC, Timothy Koza, ANC, Tanya Baka, Baker, ANC, Beatrice Ngobo, ANC. Oh, Tanya Baker, DA, pardon. Uh, Beatrice Ngobo, ANC. Fezega Loliwe, ANC. Mamwini Matigizela Mandela, ANC. Sbusiso Khatebe, ANC. Zelda Youngblood, DA. Nogukaya Adelaide Mnisi, ANC. And lastly, Minister Edna Mulewa, ANC. May their souls rest in peace. The contributions of these honorable members of parliament in service of the people of South Africa will always remain in our hearts. May they continue to rest in peace. As we go back to our constituencies to seek a renewed mandate on the 8th of May, 
we remind the people of South Africa that it is only the ANC which carries the mandate of the people's uh, plan for a better life for all. Vote ANC on the 8th of May 2018. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Chief Whip. Honorable members, that concludes the farewell speeches. And before I adjourn the House, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that even as we will adjourn the House and go wherever we go, we must remember the House and, in fact, Parliament remains adjourned but competent to do its work. Meaning, don't be surprised if we have to call you back urgently for, for, for whatever might, it might be necessary for us to come and consider. So Parliament remains competent to function until the day before the ele elections. Honorable members, we have completed the business we had planned for ourselves and therefore, for the last time in this term, this house is adjourned. Thank you very much. Pogoma, pogoma. Chona malanga, cho.